Everybody, welcome to the meeting. This board meeting, uh, let's see, is held via live stream. We're good to go with that, right, Sean? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, we, we are calling to order the. Uh, can everyone please be down before we're trying to record this? Miss Cindy, can we be quiet where we have started? Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it back there. Thank you. The governing board encourages public discussion of all agenda items. Anyone wishing to address the board may submit a comment form prior to the start of the agenda item. Discussion comment forms will not be accepted for any items once the item has been announced. A person wishing to address the board shall first be recognized by the president and shall then proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits. There is a three minute maximum speaking time per person on a single agenda item. The limit on discussing each item is 20 minutes. Board bylaw 9323 states that the board cannot comment on a non-agenda item or the matter may be placed on the agenda of a subsequent meeting for action or discussion by the board for the Brown Act. Please be advised our board meeting is recorded. Are there any public comments on closed session items? No? Okay. I have not received any papers for that. Uh, we are going to be just uh, uh, closing our meeting to go into closed session, and then we'll reconvene at 6 o'clock for the open session. Today in closed session, the board will be discussing the following items. Item 2A, public employee for, uh, agreement, employee appointment pursuant to government code 54947. Nine, 2B, public employee discipline dismissal release pursuant to government code 54947. 2C, conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code 54957.9, Negotiator Mullen Barnes, Employees Organization, Small AFT, Chapter 1494 Local, CSEA, Chapter 862, and Management Classified Employees. Item 2D, Public Employee Performance Evaluation Superintendent, Pursuant to Government Code Section 54957. All right, we'll go ahead and dismiss and see you back at 6 o'clock.
Yep, ready. Uh, we just want to welcome everybody. And I can see that there's lots of sick faces. This is where we show that we're a kind, loving community and we squash together so people can sit. You don't want to stand over there. I see seats over here. Um, this isn't like an orchestra or a concert or something fun, but there are seats straight up in front where everybody <laughs> loves to sit. We want to have to call on you. Please just come up here. Please come on in. We're happy to see you all. All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and open our meeting. Thank you, Molly. Uh, 603. Okay, welcome. Uh, this opens our public meeting at 603. We'll go ahead and stand, stand and uh, get the public I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we will go ahead and report out uh, from closed session. We're going to go ahead and report out from closed session. The board approved the following personnel changes one FTE status change increase to 0.375 FTE library clerk. Uh, one resignation point seven five FTE special education instructional aid. I'm going to go ahead and read a uh, little comment in, uh, information for you from our bylaws. The governing board encourages public discussion of all items on the agenda. Anyone wishing to address the board may submit a comment form prior to the start of the agenda item discussion. Comment forms in that corner will not be accepted for any items once the item has been announced. A person wishing to address the board shall first be recognized by the president and shall then proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits. There is a three minute maximum speaking time per person on a single agenda item. The limit on discussing each item is 20 minutes for the public. Board bylaws uh, 9323 states, the board cannot comment on a non-agenda item However, the matter may be placed on the agenda of a subsequent meeting for action or discussion by the board per the Brown Act. Uh, I just wanted to share a couple of things. Uh, as the board president, uh, it's my responsibility to chair this meeting and to conduct it with civility and order. Uh, first of all, we do welcome public comment. Thank you for all being here. We love having open discussions. We love having everyone here to share their opinions. And if you can try to not come up here and disrupt, that would be great. We'd love to hear everyone's opinion and to respect everyone. I'm glad there's so many people that care. Keep on caring. We, we appreciate it. There's a lot of good things going on around here that we're going to talk about. Our agenda is kind of long. You're in for a long meeting if you want to stay for the whole thing. We've got some great things going on. We've got progress with our facilities. We have progress with uh, FEMA for funding for our facilities. However, there have been some negative things going on. Uh, some board members have received threats via email. Some personal contact information of board members was given out to strangers by the school. There have been wild accusations and allegations. People jumping in at the last minute. Uh, people acting like they're legal experts. Some people have told me that they are afraid and they're not here tonight because they feel bullied and they feel bullied by a group that's claiming inclusion and kindness. Please include inclusion and kindness. Please be respectful of your fellow men and women. I fully support myself 
I fully support the school's goal to provide a safe, inclusive environment to all students, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, disability, nationality, sexual orientation, or gender. I hope all of you can do the same. Uh, there have been a lot of people who have made accusations who have not been involved with all the stuff we've been involved with for quite a while. Some people have arranged for spectacles tonight on all sides of various issues. Uh, likely people will try to recall some board members. That's fine. My record stands, me personally, and I think our other board members are involved, open, calm, patient, caring members of the community. At the end of the day tonight, I'm going to go home and I'm going to kiss my kids in their beds as I miss their bedtime routine tonight. I will rest knowing that despite what anyone else says about me, I care about everyone here. I care about every child in our school, every parent in our community. I will say a prayer for peace for our community, for our school, for our country. And then I will wake up and set to work the work of trying to be an example of that peace and to bring peace regardless of what our differing views are. We just pledged to be indivisible, one nation. One thing I stand for is that while schools are not intended to replace families in their primary and noble responsibility to teach and raise children, they are an important part of teaching children and supporting the community. I feel and recognize the weight of this responsibility entrusted to the board. As one of the many maxims I teach my children, you get out of something what you put into it. I would like to be a part of helping to put into this school to help people grow and thrive in the school community. This special school district is small and nimble as it has only one school and can tailor its efforts and focus on the specific needs of this small group of students. It is a school with about three quarters inter-district transfer students. It is a school of children and families that want to be here. When educators and students are together in an environment of people that want to be there, the educational focus is strong, positive, and noticeable. The longevity and positivity of the staff here is encouraging to the community and the students. It's the staff, the teachers, and especially every involved and caring family of the Snowdland School that makes it exceptional. The teachers and administrators here are the talent that keep it special, and they uh, help the future generations to have a lifelong love of learning, social skills, feeling success, academic improvement, and to provide that to every student equally and equitably. This school must be a safe place for all children to explore and grow. Four of my children are here at this school. It should be safe for all. It will be one more tool to help kids and community members think critically and act ethically. We have a responsibility as a community to ensure that improvement and the bringing up of our youth. Public schools have been established to aid in this purpose. They are entrusted by the community to deliver on that purpose and to use the funds and resources from the community as responsible stewards. We plan to live here in this district for many years to come and look forward to years of our children attending this unique, distinctive school. I would love to help make this exceptional school even more impressive by safeguarding it and building it up. We care greatly, all of us, care greatly about the trajectory of the schooling and education in our community and for our children. I can promise what I will try to do, and I hope that you all will try to do the same. I will listen with an open heart and an open mind, and I will try to be educated. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of things flying around. And then a, a quote that was attributed to Mark Twain said, a lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is still lacing up its boots. One thing I try to do is I try to seek first to understand. And I can promise you I will try my best to approach this without contention. It's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about who can approach this in a kind way. I love that our school teaches that. So that is a message that I wanted to share in order to hopefully set the tone for the civil discourse that I hope we'll have during this meeting. We will go ahead and move to the agenda item uh, to approve the agenda as it is written. 
I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Um, I move to strike agenda item 7H and agenda item 9L following reasons. Uh, uh, item 7H. Sorry. You were wanting to argue right now? Yeah. About the agenda. That's right. Okay, about the agenda. Please go ahead. Okay. So I move to strike the two uh, agenda items. Jenna, I have a so, like I said, I move to strike agenda item 7H and item 9L for the following reasons. Agenda item 7H, board reports. Go down here, right here. Give him a chance. Give him a chance to get talking. Agenda item 7H, board reports. The agenda item is impermissibly vague and, as a result, violates the Brown Act requirement in the board's bylaw 9322, which requires that each agenda item shall briefly describe each item to be transacted or discussed. The description is meaningless. As a new agenda item, there is no language describing what this matter is actually about. For example, does it mean that the board has reports to present? If so, what reports? There are no written reports included with the matter. I'm not aware of the board authorizing or directing a report to be presented to the board. The agenda item is intended to allow for board members to present reports to the board, but reports are allowed. If that's not clear, then absolutely anything presented by a member of the board will constitute a board report, which, in effect, means that the board will be free to present, discuss, and vote on anything it wants without providing proper notice to the public in accordance with the requirements of the Brown Act or the board's own bylaws. Consequently, the foregoing agenda item should be struck from the meeting agenda. Agenda item 9L, in the matter of the display of district right, uh, flags and daily performance of patriotic exercises. This agenda item should be removed because it's disruptive, unnecessary, and in violation of the board's own bylaws. The agenda item is disruptive in that, as many people have separately indicated to the board, it's a veiled attempt to inject divisive national social politics into the administration of Snow Plan. In fact, <clears throat> one supporter of this resolution is a member from Gays Against Groomers, a group that the Anti-Defamation League describes as, quote, an anti-LGBTQ extremist coalition, unquote, that has worked with the Proud Boys, a known violent extremist group, and Moms for Liberty, a far-right parent group. The agenda item is unnecessary, as there's no pending or threatening litigation with respect to flags to display at Snow Glen. And even the district's own legal counsel has made clear that flying the pride flag at Snow Glen does not raise the litigation threat, notwithstanding the claims of uh, <clears throat> the board president or his supporters. The agenda item also is in violation of the, Browns, uh, the board's own bylaws. While this agenda item is described as a resolution, it is in fact the discussion and presentation of a new district policy. This is based on, among other things, that the board president described it the September 9th letter to Snow, the fact that this is a, quote, policy for the district regarding flags. Also based on the plain meaning of the term policy. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines the term policy as a definite course or method of action selected from among alternatives and in light of a given condition to guide and determine present and future decisions, or a high-level overall plan embracing the general goals and acceptable procedures, especially of a governmental body. A resolution, on the other hand, is defined merely as a formal expression of opinion, will, or intent voted by an official body or assembly group, unquote. As the proposed resolution requires that the superintendent take action to cause the display only of the U.S. and state of California flags and to ensure, quote, to ensure daily compliance, quote, uh, unquote, with Ed Code 52720, it's not merely an expression of opinion, will, or intent, but a policy presented in violation of Board Bylaw 9310. Board Bylaw 9310 requires the following steps shall be taken. They include the board and superintendent or a designate shall identify the need for a new policy or revision of an existing policy. As needed, the superintendent shall gather fiscal data, staff, and public input related to district policies, sample policies from the California School Board Association or other organizations or agencies, and other useful information and data to fully inform the board about a particular issue. 
Board may hold discussions during a public board meeting to gain an understanding of the issue and provide initial direction to the superintendent or designee. Discussion may include, among other things, community expectations, staff recommendations, and the expected impact of the policy on student learning and well being, equity, governance, and the district's fiscal resources and operational efficiency. The board or superintendent may request that legal counsel review the draft policy as appropriate. The superintendent or designee shall develop and present a draft policy for a first reading at a public board meeting. And at its second reading, the board may take action on the proposed policy. None of that has happened. Given this, I uh, <coughs> demand and motion that item 9 now be removed from the agenda as in violation of the board's own bylaws. There's no requirement for a second. Board's bylaws do not state anywhere that it requires a second in order to vote on a matter. And so based on that factor and the fact that Board Bylaw 9323 does provide, that the board believes that when no conflict of interest requires abstentions, its members have a duty to vote on issues before them. So I know what. Its members have a duty to vote on issues before them. When no conflict of interest requires abstentions, I motion that we accept the agenda as written. We have a motion, uh, second on that motion. Do you second? Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, vote. Uh, approval of the agenda. Aye. No. Vote against. Okay. All right. Uh, Can you recite? It's unclear to me what his, what his deal was about. Is he for taking You can't talk. talk. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item six, public hearing textbook sufficiency. It is, um, when you have to open it. Okay, so, Soglin Unified School District Board of Education will hold public hearing Tuesday, September 12, 2023, 6 p.m. Snow Glen Unified School District Library. Textbook sufficiency. On September 12, 2023, the governing board will consider a resolution verifying that each K through 8 pupil thank you, uh, has sufficiently sufficient textbooks and instructional materials in the four core curricular areas for the 23-24 school year and certify that the textbooks are aligned to state standards. The public is invited to comment on the issue before the board or decision. We'll go ahead and open that comment period. Sorry, just getting these. Need to look through them. And are these in order already or no? They're numbered how they were received. Okay. Okay. Sorry, just making sure we don't have any on for this item. Molly, did you have anything you wanted to say about this one while I'm looking through? I here? will happily undertake. All right. So <laughs> we um we're happy to share with everybody that we have textbooks sufficient for all of our students at Sonoma Glen School, and we feel very confident that our students are well prepared for their learning. So we're doing a good job. <laughs> You see that my students are waiting. Yay! Hey. 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 Hey for learning. Yay yeah. hey for homework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I'm on roll. I noticed that. No, I didn't. We hear that. Okay, so seeing that we don't have any comment forms for this agenda item, I'll open it to the board for any discussion. Ted, Linda? No. No, and I don't have any either, so we'll go ahead and uh, we need to make an action to close it and then can we approve it. I'll go ahead and close the, the discussion. Later on, okay, we'll approve it later on. That's once a year thing, formality. Thank you for putting up with that. Uh, number seven, uh, board and staff reports and communication. We'll start with 7A SRT report and presentation. Where's our SRT? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, celebration for us, and this is SRT 
them for our Seoul Repertoire Theater, and we adore them. Great partnership with them. And here they are to, I think, give us some good news. <laughs> when I asked to be on the agenda today, I have no idea how it was. <laughs> oh. Sorry. It's okay. Sure. It is. <laughs> yes. So, um, as many of you know, um, SRT, Small Repertory Theater, every year donates their proceeds to the school. And this has funded, at least partially, their arts programs throughout the years. This year is no different. Um, and so, I will be this to you. <laughs> but first, a little story. Because there's always drama behind the drama. And this year was no different. Um, Partway through the sales of our tickets, we were using an online ticketing agency. Um, they were sold, they, they were bought by a larger company, and they stopped transferring the funds to our account. We were owed over $6,300 at the end of the season, and by July, our treasurer kind of gave up. He had been calling and emailing once a week and got nowhere. Someone suggested that they call seven on our side. And, <laughs> and, and and they came through for us. <laughs> and they came up for school <laughs> without these two. Uh, SRT has been here for 40 years. We've donated over uh, our, our, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the art program here. Um, we perform in March. Uh, we will have uh, auditions the end of November or maybe the beginning of December. We do one melodrama a year. Um, it would be lovely to see some of you come out. We uh, rehearse every Tuesday, Thursday at school, and the performance is in March. So please, um, join us. Uh, we chose a melodrama because the level of acting 
it's we are capable of it. So, <laughs> so please, thanks to these two. Thank you, thank you, SRT, Small Report Theater, for supporting the school. Thank you for being good partners. We appreciate your kindness and your generosity in donating to the school. Uh, item 7B, 2022 2023. I know that's why you're all here for the unaudited actual uh, reports. <laughs> My name is Tara Sledges Owens, and I'm the acting CBO for um, Sonoma Unified School District on behalf of Alameda County Office of Education. I just want to say um, good evening to the board, board president, board trustee, Superintendent Barnes. Uh, I am going to present the unaudited, the 22-23 unaudited actuals um, report for the Sonoma Unified School District. The unaudited actuals report basically captures all the financial and fiscal activity related to the district's revenue and expenses from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, um, 2023. Next slide, please. So 22-23, what a year Sonoma Green has, um, has had. It's been very eventful. Um, we first we passed the, the Measure J um, general obligation bond, which is about $10.9 which is going to allow the district to update, repair, and modernize our current facilities. In the beginning of the year, unfortunately, we had the 20, sorry, 20, 2023 winter flood, which was devastating to our site, to our community, but it helped bring our community together to show that we can persevere through trying times. Um, our teachers and staff are well, de well deserving of salary increases because they're the ones who make the um, direct impact on our, on our students. Um, they give support, educational services to our next generation of learners. Our, they're going to be engineers, doctors, lawyers, teachers. Um, so we um, gave them an 8% on salary schedule increase for our certificated, classified, and managed employees. And also, um, we got a grant called the Kitchen Infrastructure and Training Funds Grant of about $108,000. And um, that could be spent on cooking equipment, service equipment, refrigeration, and storage, and we have until June um, 30th, of June 30, 2025 to spend these funds. So um, we're going to be looking forward to allocating those funds um, next year. Next slide, please. Um, these are some key observations um, for 22-23. Um, first and foremost, ADA and enrollment are the key determinants of an LEA's um, funding. So at adopted budget in July of 20. 22. Um, our enrollment was projected to be two, 281, um, and our ADA was 270. However, at an RT Actuals, our enrollment was um, 268, and our ADA was 257. It increased by about 13. Um, although our actual enrollment and ADA was below our projections, we were still able to meet our fiscal obligations, and we even ended the year with a surplus. So we are projecting our ADA and enrollment data to return to pre-pandemic levels, um, hopefully by 25, fiscal year 25, 26. Um, there's a general fund surplus. Um, normally there's a surplus when our revenues exceed our total expenditures, and as a result, our expenditures, um, we have a, a we have a surplus of about $448,000, and that's good because instead of having a deficit, which means we, we would have had um, our expenditures are greater than our revenues, we have an, we have excess. Um, our ending fund balance, I'm going to talk more about that later, is about $1.8 million, and that increased um, from our estimated actuals by about $411,000. We have an unassigned and unappropriated fund balance of about $676,000. That um, chunk of money represents money that we kind of, it's kind of like a savings account, you know, after we've um, paid all of our, our bills, our expenses, this is what we have left, left over. And um, also, most importantly, we met our reserve for economic uncertainties. It's 5%. Um, so no Glenn is required to contribute um, or set aside 5% of our total expenditures plus our transfers out, and um, we were able to meet that. And the, the percentage is determined by the, um, by the ADA. It depends on what school district you are. Sometimes it's 
40 percent, 3 percent, but we have a 5 percent requirement. Next slide, please. This is just a high level summary of our financials. Our total revenues for 22 um, 23 were 5.1 million. Our total expenditures were 4.6 million. So, as you can see, our revenues exceeded our expenditures, which created an operating surplus for us versus a deficit. Um, we had some other financing sources. We had to make a contribution to um, the cafeteria fund, which is um, normal for that fund to have a, a deficit. Um, therefore, that created an um, increase to our fund balance of about 440000 We started off the year in July with a $1.4 million beginning balance. So once you do the math, calculate it, um, our end fund balance is $1.8 uh, Okay, I'm sorry, the numbers are a little small, but I'm going to go over that. Just need a big magnifying glass. Um, um, these, this is basically a comparison between our estimated actuals when I came to the board in June, and I presented the estimated actuals with the adopted budget, and this is compares um, our estimated actuals to our unaudited actuals. Basically, our unaudited actuals is um, what the real deal, what we received and what we spent for fiscal year 22 23. Um, so basically, at the end of the year, we're in a good financial position. Um, our actual revenues came in a little higher. We got more LCFS revenue. Um, we have more other local revenue. Um, our actual expenses came in a little less specifically in the areas of books and supplies and services and other operating expenses. We like to budget conservatively, and so sometimes we have to put a little cushion in there, but that's good because you never know if things come up, floods, um, <laughs> just, you know, things you just have. Sometimes you have no control over, so it's good to have a cushion in your in your checkbook or in your in your bank. Um, so that's what um, what we like to do. Um, we have an operating surplus, as I keep mentioning, and so we're not um, deficit spending. Next slide, please. Um, this report just kind of tells the story. This is. Um, what happened throughout the year. I, at, in July, um, June, I came to tell you about the adopted budget, and then I updated the budget at um, first interim in December, and then I came back in March with the second interim, and then I came back in um, June at, at, with un your estimated actuals, and now I'm here in September <laughs> with the unaudited actuals. And so basically, this just gives us some analysis of, um, of our financial, what happened throughout the year. Um, just a high level summary we have um, more revenues we got um, more uh, one-time funding for our universal pre-k in-person um, instruction grants we got um, um, arts and music and in another arts and music and instruction grant um, our expenses kind of increased from 4.1 million to 4.6 million but that's because we had um, an increase um, we gave our teachers our well deserving teachers and certificate and classified employees um, an eight percent salary increase. Um, we also had some an increase in our audit expenditures and our legal fees. But at the um, at the very end of the year, again, our fund balance is $1.8 million. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graphical representation of our um, revenue. Again, we generated about $5.1 million in revenue. 63% um, of our of our revenue is generated from LCFS sources. And this is the major um, category for all across the board, across all school districts. The majority of their revenue comes from LCFS sources, and that's why ADA and enrollment is very important because that's our driver. And then the other sources are federal revenue, other state revenue, and other local revenue. Next slide, please. The same thing, it's another graphical representation of our expenditures for Sonoblin. Um, total expenditures were about 4.6 million. Um, Again, with any school district, um, the budget is normally um, constituted of about 80 to 85 percent of a district's budget is made up of salaries and benefits, and ours follows suit. We're about at 83 percent, and the other categories are books and supplies, services, and other operating expenditures, and capital outlay. Next slide, please. Um, some of our programs require a contribution from the general fund to cover yearly expenses because maybe the program does not generate enough revenue. And so these are a list of the programs, special education. Um, just to highlight, um, there's a, um, 
We have an ongoing maintenance. That's, that's called our routine restricted maintenance account, or our RNA, and we are required um, to deposit 3% of our total general fund expenditures into this account. And so that's what that $134,000 represents. And that's, that money is used to maintain school facilities, to keep them in good repair, repair, and this is done at the end of the year. And so total contributions for all those programs total about 400 and about $479,000. Next slide, please. And just to reiterate, I kind of want to break down the um, $1.8 million. This is how it is allocated. So um, there's the, your, our revolving fund, our prepaid items. Uh, let's see, we have some stabilization agreements. These are additional reserves for economic uncertainties. We have um, um, $150,000 that we set aside for special education funding. So this is like our reserve. And this is what the $1.8 million is made up of. And again, that unassigned and appropriate, appropriate amount is around $676,000. Next slide, please. I'm almost done. Um, other than a general fund, we have other funds like our cafeteria fund, our building fund, our um, capital facilities fund, and so all of them have activity throughout the year, and um, it's good that they also, too, have an ending fund balance. And so the ending fund balance for those funds were $3.7 million. Next slide, please. Okay, um, it, um, just to give you an update on our local programs, we have the Eagle's Nest and the preschool. These are our, our little learners. <laughs> um, so for the Eagle's Nest, um, our revenues exceeded the expenditure, so there was no need for a contribution to this program. Um, with the preschool, um, there was a small contribution needed of, of about $18,000 to cover the, the expenses. So when you met them, um, the, need, the contribution amount wasn't, wasn't um, significant. So that's good that our programs are becoming sustainable. Okay. Um, next slide. So overall, Snow Glen um, Unified ended the school fiscal year 22-23 better than anticipated at estimated actuals. Um, the general funds ending balance for unaudited actuals is 1.8 million, representing an increase of about $411,000 from the projected in-funding in funding balance at estimated actuals. And additionally, we are ending the year with a surplus versus a deficit spending. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, we're going to have an um, independent financial audit of the 22-23 unaudited actuals, and we're going to have, also have a bond audit. And um, then I'm going to update the 23-24 budget based on what I just presented this afternoon. And then I'll be back in December to present the first interim report for 23, fiscal year 23-24. And we're going to continue to monitor our ADA and enrollment um, for 23 and 24 and beyond. And we're just going to continue to monitor the budget so we can ensure that the students of Sonoma have everything that they need, that they have supplies, their, their books, they're being, uh, the teachers are, are being um, taken care of. So um, we're going to make sure that Sonoma is fiscally solvent. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs> Uh, I just really appreciate the county works very, very hard and diligently with Sylvan. We're one school school district and we have a strong partnership with the county and we really appreciate, appreciate all the work from Tara and her team, Eileen, their wonderful Bessie from our front office, Mickey, um, everybody works really hard. And the good news is there's money. We, we, and it's awesome. So good on Sonoma. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to item 7C, enrollment report. Hold so we're holding steady. Uh, feel really good about that. We're at 271. That's great. Yay, yay, yay. And as Tara said, this, these numbers are critical. Um, 
What's, what happened post pandemic is we saw across the state of California chronic absenteeism. So we have been working really hard with our families to impress upon them the need to be in school, to be darlings here. Even past school, just be here, never leave. Spend the night learning, I love it. Uh, I'll just keep making you learn. Uh, so we really appreciate that partnership with parents and we do hope. Oh, look at that. We do appreciate having the opportunity um, to help uh, hope that they will take their vacations during our times off and have the kids here all 180 days if possible. So it's going really well this year. Better, we've seen better attendance than last year. We're just really excited. Perfect. Any comments from board members? Okay. Uh, and we'll go right into 7D superintendent's report. Uh -oh. <laughs> the dog ate it. Who said that? <laughs> the dog ate my homework. All right, I did want to give my usual updates. I'm going to try to do it from memory because so I, I think the, I think I left it back in the office. But if this is the time where we just do some celebration for the school. And um, we did have our open house. And I know for some of you, there's lots of parents in here and maybe people that were parents at an earlier time. Open house is a huge, or back to school night, excuse me, is a huge celebration for us. I think everything has now sort of a post-pandemic lens to it where we couldn't have our parents here on campus. And so it was really exciting to have the families here live in person and the staff, which a bunch of them are here live in person. And it was well attended, as is true for the Sonoma Glen Way. We also have um, Garden Day. We have our very first Garden Day. If you have not had an opportunity to tour our beautiful school, I would really encourage you at the end of this Glenfield meeting to make your way out to the garden. It is absolutely gorgeous out there. And that place was destroyed. Oh, that. This is a golden administrative assistant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Saving your boss again. Um, yeah, Garden Day was on August 22nd, and this is absolutely super exciting for us. Uh, we lost uh, some chickens. No chickens died in the flood. They were actually gone before that. But chickens are back, so we had, woo, we had, um, and this is really cool, a, a former Sonoblin student had two chickens that hatched here in Sonol, and he took them home and raised them, added a couple, uh, three more, and he donated them back to the school. And so we now have five chickens, and they built the coop, and so none of those raccoons are going to eat our chickens. So we are super oh! excited. Welcome to Sonoblin. These are the things that make our day. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Martin Marietta Corey. For those of you that were able to go to the SAC board meeting last month, uh, this is this is actually really phenomenal. That we were promised as a Sonoma Glen school about 40 years ago that we would get a nice generous amount of money to help mitigate the um, potential destruction of our windows and doors of the main building. And then you know, checks in the mail, checks in the mail, checks in the mail, years go by, years go by. And um, it was pretty much a surprise and a big thank you to this woman, Miss Connie DeGrange. Hello. Yes. We were presented with a $340,291.38 check. And I'm sure the 38 cents are still that. And that's going to go towards the main building's windows and doors. So that's super exciting. And then I also want to give a shout out. Um, at, also came up and informed Sonol. Thank you, Andrew Trimble. That there was some concern about traffic flow. No, nobody has that concern. Yes, we do. And so I was at the SAC board meeting in August, and I let the deputies know that this was a concern of the town. And again, it was uh, commuters and also some of our parents, I'm hearing. And so they promised to come out and be a presence. And since then, we have seen people slow down. You know, children's lives are, are precious. All of our lives are precious, and we really need people to slow down. So a big shout out to our sheriff's department for helping us ensure a safe place. <laughs> and as is true of Sonoma tradition, our annual walkathon, our big fundraiser, is coming up. Mark your calendars, September 29th. And guess what the theme is? Aloha. So that's exciting. And a big thank you to Trisha Young and her walkathon team. So that's coming up.
self-evident, that all men are created equal, Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, 247 years ago. As a superintendent principal of Sunil Glenn, I serve as the instructional leader, responsible for the academic, physical, and social-emotional well-being of all our students and staff. I am very appreciative of everyone coming over tonight. And I want to beseech everyone to please remember that it serves no purpose to vilify one another. This is a topic in which both sides, all sides, feel strongly about. And it is critical that we exemplify a respectful community that holds different and varying viewpoints. This is a place of children. I view schools as rather hallowed barren grounds in that the work that we do here has a critical and profound effect on the current students who then go on to further education and then their lives as adults. Everything we do, say, and demonstrate seeps into their very fabric and our very core. That then trickles into the student's experience. Our children deserve an experience that shows that, yes, people may have polar opposite opinions, and yet they can be respectful. As this is an educational institution, as we do in schools, your lucky night, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> I want to go back to the resolution the previous board from three years ago adopted on June 8, 2021. You're also lucky, I'm not going to read it to you, but it's there. At that time, the Alameda County Office of Education invited all the districts in Alameda County to demonstrate solidarity in supporting the marginalized group, the LGBTQ plus community, who was also noted as a protected class by the federal government, as students in the LGBTQ plus community are at much higher risk for depression, anxiety, self-medication, and tragically, even suicide. The county request was to pass a resolution and to illustrate our support for the LGBTQ plus students by flying the rainbow flag during the month of June, as it is designated as Pride Month. Our board deliberated this call to action very carefully, realizing that we are the Sonoma community, and as such, we have families that have diverse beliefs on various issues including this one. Therefore, out of respect for all families and bearing the responsibility of wanting to be a part of ensuring that all students and families were provided with the reassurance that the Sonoblan School embraces the philosophy of providing an equitable opportunity for an equal education. And that in order to demonstrate this, we would participate in this call to action we decided to broaden our demonstration and be as inclusive as possible. And so we did choose to fly not the rainbow flag unto itself, but rather the inclusivity flag. Flags are symbols. And I want to share that you may or may not know what the inclusivity flag colors represents according to one website. You know, Google, but I found one. All right, here it is. The color red represents perseverance, blue, compassion, green, growth, violet, passion, black, strength and unity, yellow, glory, gray, humility, brown, wholesomeness, orange, joy, and success. Turquoise, wisdom, and balance. I say with full confidence, actually, that everyone in this room would agree that those qualities I just listed are wonderful qualities. In addition to selecting this particular flag, 
the board decided that the flagpole was the only place that the American flag and the California flag should be flown. And out of respect for our country and state, we decided to purchase the inclusivity banner and to put it on our fence line. I drove to several schools and district offices in the county during the month of June. And the ones I visited, I did not visit them all, but there's 18 of them, had the flag up on their flag poles under the American flag or in lieu of the California flag. Right next door in Pleasanton, where our Sonoma students attend high school at Foothill High School, we have an MOU with Foothill High School. That's our high school, that's the Civil Residence High School District. And we do things together with them. We align with them. And Foothill High School, Pleasanton Unified School District has the pride flags and we're flying them. They recently passed an updated resolution that was uh, passed unanimously on, in their June board meeting. For our district, our discussions and later decisions was this was a good way to demonstrate our respect for the American and California state flags and still show our support for the LGBTQ plus community that deserves our message that we see you, you are welcome here, you are safe, and you are loved. story, I want to share another value that we imbue with our students here at Civil Glen. We are an educational institution and we are charged with educating folks. So here's the lesson I want to teach. There is a difference between equality and equity. And there's the visual. You, a lot of you may have seen that visual. So you can see that equality is that all of them are able to go to the game. You can see the game from behind the fence. But you can see two of them can't really see the game. Equity is that there's a there's steps up for them to see. It's just to provide that illustration. That equality allows for all students to attend school. However, schools are charged with a very precious and meaningful and important, crucially important responsibility of ensuring all students have an equitable opportunity for an equal education, an equitable opportunity for an equal education. <laughs> and yes, that means we may and should have to provide some differences for them. In the classroom, for example, this means that some students may need to sit on a wheelchair or may need longer time to complete their assignments or may need to have the teacher read the test questions out loud to them. These are examples where the children do not have equal experiences, but because the students have different needs, we are beholden to providing support so that they have an equitable opportunity for their learning. Some may say, well, if you have that flag, you should have the fly flags for everything. That is the same as saying, well, if you have a child that needs a wiggle seat, all children should get a wiggle seat. All children should have more time on their assignments. All children should have their test questions read out loud. No, that is false logic. The child with the wiggle seat, for example, may have ADHD and needs the seat to calm their movements so that they may access their learning, equal access. Likewise, we chose to fly the inclusivity flag so that the students from the LGBTQ plus community themselves and or their family members would know that we are a place of equal equity and inclusivity and the symbol of the flag solidifies that message. Now tonight, there's a resolution and our board members have been clear about where they stand. Actually, this is my report. This is my message. I understand, but our reports, just like uh, Trustee Romo pointed out, our reports need to not be talking about others. Or just the director. 
Uh, I can finish my report, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Our attorney said I could finish it, so I'm going to finish it. This is Thank you. This is my report, and it's my time to give my report. The, the chair recognizes you to give a report about the school, but can you refrain from addressing other agenda items? I'm here. I'm actually not addressing that agenda item because what I'm giving, I'm telling the history of what happened, and that's not the, your your resolution is for what you want to happen in the future. And my report, as as was asked from by many people, is to express explain how we got here tonight. Thank you. Uh, now I need to find my post. Some may say, well, if you have flags, that you should fly flags for everything. That is the same as saying, are you reading this? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, now I got it. Now tonight there is a resolution, and as our board members have been clear about where they stand, if there's a probable outcome or not, the members were elected for the, but they were elected by the town of Seville, and it is their right to become, to vote on items according to their views and beliefs. And I'm going to be respectful of that. And this is a public meeting, and community comments are welcome. We will be having folks that want to speak in support of the resolution, and we will have folks that want to speak in opposition of the resolution. That is how board meetings work. And again, it is everyone's right to have the opportunity to speak. However, I am imploring you to please remain respectful and civil. Please do not engage in name calling hyperbolic language, or remarks that are inflammatory. We can all share our viewpoints, thoughts, and opinions without having to go down that road. Please remember, our children are watching. We know that there are folks that have exact opposite viewpoints from one another, so a call for civility is a reasonable request. It should not be too much to ask in these hallowed halls of our school. Let's join together and demonstrate for our children that one of the things that make America wonderful is we that are all allowed to have our own opinions and we are all allowed to express them. Also, yes, the flag is a symbol, an important one, and symbols are used to represent something. It is how we express a message. On the other hand, a flag is just that. It's just a symbol. I am proud of the symbol blend staff and everyone's commitment to being vigilant and present as we embrace all of our students and work tirelessly to ensure that regardless of what symbols we have or we don't have, our school community and culture is one of acceptance, love, and support. All are welcomed here. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And at Simmel Glenn, we hold that all humans deserve equity. of my superintendent's report, and I am including as part of my report 
an extension of the report to allow a staff the staff to have their time to discuss what they would like to discuss. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! questions during any agenda item. It's not something that you control, and I can ask the question of our legal counsel whether or not it is appropriate to allow the teachers to speak as part of the superintendent's report. I can, get that, I can ask that. I'm asking that question right now. You can ask questions of the board. No, nope. you can. I can speak. ask. I can ask questions of our counsel and advise us I'm here sorry. at this meeting. Yes, I can. I chair the meeting. You cannot. We Are you not the counsel, counsel to this? But the chair does not recognize the attorney Josh to speak. Why not? Why not? Why not? What is the why issue not? with what? Why is there an issue with asking our counsel to advise us? Because we have protocol. We have a way that we there's run our censorship meeting. and there's protocol. Ow! There's a way that we're running our meeting. We're trying to follow decorum. We're trying to follow parliamentary rules. But she believes what are the that. rules? What are the rules for this? Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know the rules. If you don't have anything more to say, we will move on to item 17. Um, I'm sorry, I, do, I, I, very much, I very much respect you teachers. I respect what you have to say. Um, this is the rest of my report. Dear Board President Ryan Jurgensen, Board Member Ted Romo, Board Member Linda Hurley, and Superintendent Molly Barnes. Oh, that's me. We are your <laughs> teachers at Sanol Glen, and I am a teacher. I keep my credential current. Writing to you with the deepest concern in regards to item 9, 9L on tonight's board meeting agenda. We would like to see it removed completely. If not, then modified as suggested by board member Ted Romo to say further resolve that no other flag may be flung. I feel like I'm feeling you're not like you're not reflecting me. I am the superintendent and I am I'm on the agenda. Do we have the deputies here? Can you uh, escort people out when we uh, point them out? Th thank you for being here, deputies. We appreciate your help. I apologize to the Sonoma staff for being treated in this manner. Um, you guys are welcome to leave if this is disheartening to you, and I can see that it is. Or um, I, if, Re if President Jurgensen will allow you to speak, and in the early uh, when that comment at, at, at 9L, if they would like to talk about that agenda item, they're free to turn in the comment card just like every other member no, of the committee. No, no, they turned in the comment card and, and I removed it because they were allowed to speak. Because we got we have legal advice that said that they could they don't I'll, I'll have, let them speak first if they want to. Just so that point advice. of order is okay to not follow, but the point of order what, what, what I was order gonna is, do what, what is, point of order is okay not to follow. You just said I will take a comment card, but you haven't had a comment card from them. If they give me a comment card, I can put them at that agenda item. At the appropriate agenda item to discuss that topic. I'd be happy to have them speak. I am sorry. I feel that I'm on, on behalf of the staff, I feel very, um, I, I'm sorry you're feeling disrespected. 
And if you don't mind waiting, then you guys could there's, there's no disrespect intended. We did have legal counsel that allowed for this, but we are being honored. Okay. We're going to move to So I want to, uh, I'm Bill Savage, I'm a facilities consultant helping the district implement the Measure J bond, and I want to share some progress on uh, our task of upgrading the facilities here at Old Glen School. So I know it's a, there's a different topic for the meeting, but if we could take just a second to talk about the, the amazing school we have here and how we want to fix it up. So next slide, please. Uh, brief agenda tonight, I want to share with you our architectural selection process that's on the board's agenda for approval tonight. Share with you a little bit more about the main building structural evaluation and the destructive testing that's underway, and give a brief report on projects and design. Next slide, please. So uh, we prepared and circulated a request for qualifications for architectural services. So if you sorry, back, sorry. Um, to 10 firms, and we focused on, in the RQ, finding firms that had experience on historic buildings like the main building here at Sonal, but also were well-versed in cost-effective modernization. We have a small bond program. We need to act cost-effectively and find solutions that we can afford for the money that we have. And we were looking for firms that have experience working with smaller districts because they're unique in, and, and it's a, just a unique environment for all of us. So, we circulated uh, to 10 firms. We received uh, submittals from six firms. We shortlisted four firms, and that included uh, HK Architects from Oakland, LCA Architects from Walnut Creek, uh, Avis Architects from San Jose, and Hamilton Aiken Architects from San Francisco. We had an interview panel that included the superintendent, Mr. Hoxie, myself, and um, Board President Jurgensen, and we uh, the, the unanimous recommendation of the uh, interview panel was to include two firms, Adis Architects and Hamilton Aitken Architects. And if you can go to the next slide, please, give you an example of uh, one of the firms. Uh, Adis Architects is a San Jose firm. They have extensive experience working on older buildings. Uh, I worked with them at the Fremont Union High School District uh, at Fremont High, uh, renovating the main building, which was the first high school in Silicon Valley, and they did a fantastic job on that. And the picture on the right is Washington High School in San Leandro. And so they have experience with the type of project that's really focused on the, our main building, including doing seismic renovations on the main buildings uh, like that. So. And the other firm, next slide please, is uh, uh, Hamilton Aitken Architects from San Francisco. They have extensive modernization experience, <coughs> seismic upgrades to buildings. The slide on the right is from the Maritime Center that I worked with them on. That's part of the Rosie the Riveter National Historic Homefront Park. And they did a wonderful job on that. You can see a historic interior in the center. And this, the slide on the right is from Burlingame Intermediate School, so work on outside learning areas for students. So we're bringing that recommendation to the board for uh, action later this evening. And this is a sign of progress, really, on implementing Measure J, because we have to get the architects on board and get them working in order to make progress. Next slide, please. So the next step is the staff recommendation for tonight and uh, an authorization for us to seek uh, a proposal for the highest priority project right now is to get the classrooms in back reinstalled, the three classrooms. And part of the reason that that's a high priority for us is that when we undertake the real work of renovating and seismically upgrading the main building, we're going to need to pull everybody out of it for a year or so. And 
the, having the three buildings in the back and having the two temporary portables that we'll look at in a second up front will give us five spaces that will allow us to then move some of our functions out of the main building in a successful fashion. That's, it. That's the overall approach that we're operating on. So next slide, please. I uh, want to give you an update. The geotechnical engineers were finally able to uh, reach the required depths when they came out the first time. Their drill rig was a little bit too small, and they hit refusal uh, way short of where they needed to be. They came back on August 29th. They successfully bored. You can see each of the boring locations shown there, which will cover the back installation, the temporary portables, the main building, and next to the MPR. So that in case we have to do any foundation work on the main building, at least we have our characterization for soils in that area. Next slide, please. So the structural evaluation of the main building, as uh, the board knows, we have retained ZFA structural engineers. They've completed an initial analysis and they've found uh, some significant and uh, critical deficiencies, but they can't complete their analysis or prepare the final uh, uh, schematic structural sketches for upgrades without some destructive testing because we don't have the original build uh, drawings for the main building. So we got a proposal from Flint Builders and it's on the board's uh, uh, calendar for ratification tonight and they would perform a destructive testing in order to confirm the rebar and uh, horizontal vertical spacing of the rebar the exact dimensions of all of the shear walls and a number of items on the inside that will help us determine what is the lateral force resisting capacity of our main building. Sorry, I didn't mean to get technical, but just, it's really important for us in designing the main building structural evaluation. So uh, they will complete that information once we have done the destructive testing. Next slide, please. I think I'm almost done. Yes, I know. So uh, we have one project that's in design. It's not a bond-funded project, but it's an important project because it helps us to recover from the flood. We have two portables that are going to be placed. The slide on the right is the site plan, the main building, and you can see the diagonal parking in front. Two portables would be placed there, temporary portables. They are being submitted to the Division of State Architect for approval yesterday. And we anticipate four to six weeks for approval, and we'll be coming back to the board with um, bidding, uh, preparation, and other uh, minor consultants like a DSA inspector that we're going to need in order to perform the construction work on those buildings uh, in a timely fashion. And that's my report for tonight. Any questions to the board? Yes. So I called you. I wanted to find out, clarify. It looks like you want us to ratify both the architects. It do. So the recommendation, why do we need two well, it's a, it's a it's a fair question, board member. Really. Um, first of all, we already have one architect working for the district, and that's Hamilton Aitken. And um, they, I mean, the, the, let me step back from that. The simpler answer is they were both highly qualified. They both scored were ranked right next to each other. Uh, Hamilton Aitken is already here. They were they've also done. Preliminary work, we had a preliminary DSA meeting regarding the placement of buildings in the back. So they're already sort of involved in that project. But, and the flip side is, uh, the, the other firm that we were looking for, a firm that had really focused experience on buildings just like the main building. And so ADIS Architects fits that bill. And so yes, our recommendation is to declare two firms qualified to work on the program, and then the district would go through a process of seeking proposals from a firm for a specific project, and we'll we'll keep the board informed as we go through that process. So, it's my understanding when we approved Hamilton and Aiken that that was just for the portables, and we were doing this under an emergency <laughs> um, thing, and as I talked to other people, it really wasn't an emergency it was maybe urgent but not an emergency and so i'm concerned now we're bringing hamilton aiken into this older building whereas that was not what we agreed <coughs> on originally I, yeah I, I understand what you're saying i think my focus is when a district has a new bond measure and a new source of funding the process is always to go through a, a selection of 
qualified firms at every level, whether it's an architect or engineers, the geotechs that we brought to the surveyor, and to go and to do a process that's called competitive selection. So you base the selection of your qualified firms on their demonstrated competence in performing the services that you're seeking. And I, I and my recommendation would be that the board uh, approve these two firms. Another thing to remember about Hamilton Aiken is they did an extensive assessment of your district and all of the facilities here. They're very familiar with the district. And so I have a problem with that assessment, actually. Okay. Well, anyway, that, but that is our recommendation that we have two qualified firms. And then we, Can I have a question? Sure. What was it about HKIT that you're not picking them out before? I, in the interviews that we did, I thought they were an excellent architect. And, and I think they are too. I've worked with them and I'm working with them on other projects. Um, they they didn't have quite as much experience on historic buildings like the main building at Sonoma. Uh, they did they had one historic building renovation in at Oakland Unified, where they actually tore down most of the school but kept the facade. A little bit different. Um, we were just we were more impressed. I think the interview panel, I was anyway, with the way that ADIS approached it and presented themselves and their interest in working collaboratively with contractors at an early phase in the process uh, and their previous work history. That was our recommendation. And is it okay to pick two, not just one? It is okay. Is it because okay? the board is not offering a contract. This is simply to create two firms that are qualified as a pool under the Measure J bond. And to start negotiating contracts. To start negotiating, correct. Would it be possible to do that with people? It would. Okay. Might be, I mean, you know, you could do one, two, or three. So, so or would, more, it, more. would it be possible on agenda item K that we possibly make a motion at that time to maybe add the third one? Yeah, yeah that is definitely within the board's purview. That is the recommendation from the panel, so it's just the two. The recommendation is the two. So this would be just your goal to add the third. Uh, I, I don't know. That's that's my I problem. From like being sitting here. I have a problem with him taking it that this goes to a contract that was signed prior to our coming on board that um, is a, an agreement between Hamilton Aiken and Mullen Barnes to draw prepare a conceptual plan and three-dimensional drawing for a building to replace and expand the existing multi-purpose building. And we were told as voters there would be no new building. And Molly has made this clear that she heard the public when we surveyed them after um, Measure O failed. And she said, we heard you. You didn't want two bonds at the same time to be paying on, and you didn't want new building. So we have this contract between the two of them, and then they were standing there when we were walking through and seeing the school, and Mr. Um, Mike Picard is at speaking to all of us that were there and telling us there will be no new construction. And they were both standing there knowing full well they signed that contract. So I have a little problem with Mr. Hamilton as being honest and trustworthy to even work with. Okay, I, I hear you, and I, I wasn't aware of that, so I apologize. But um, I, I obviously the board can take the recommendation and modify the recommendation, of course, for deliberation. So okay, thank thank you very much for your update, Bill. I really appreciate the effort you did to go out, find these people, set up those uh, interviews, it was conducted uh, very consistent, professionally. Thank you very much for running that. Thank you, Bill. Right. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, we'll move on to item 7F, facilities and maintenance report. Mr. Hoxie. Woo, Mr. Hoxie. Oh, yeah. Okay, we got about seven or eight pictures of it. We had, uh, since the last board meeting, we've had several contractors on site. We had some tree work. It's not in order I thought they were in. But anyway, we had some tree limbs <laughs> that actually fell um, during the summer and a couple of in the last month. So what we did is... Um, Actually, we were in the process of getting a tree survey done. 
and he's missed half of the fall, so I figured I'd just show you what we had to clean up. Um, yeah, that's it on the trees, I think. The report that he has, actually most of the trees are in pretty good shape. Then I just took a picture of the guy out there. He's the uh, survey guy and he went around. He, we checked all the trees on the site and he's uh, assessed them, uh, how dangerous they are or whatever. The biggest recommendation is we have one tree he would like to do a tier three report on, which means he'd have to come back and do some drilling to just see how safe it is. Because he's kind of worried that the whole tree might fall off, not just the limb. Other than that, all the trees are pretty safe. Um, you know, there are, these trees will drop limbs. That's just part of the, the tree. So, and that's the tree out by the ball wall. Yeah, that was out by the ball wall, the one that lost the limbs recently. The next slides, um, like I said, we had contractors looking. They redid the track from the flooding damage. Um, you know, this is what the, it looked like after the flood after we piled a bunch of mud up. Keep going. And this is what it looks like now. Wow. Next one. You know, that's the main straightaway there. Next one. No, that's what it looks like now. So uh, that was it for the tracks, I believe. And uh, we also had the guy come in and he redid the playground. Um, the green area down there that was destroyed. This is what it looked like after we cleaned it up. And this is what it looks like now. The kids are actually playing. So, then the next one. Oh, sorry. No, no, we, saw this. we had the fence work done. Um, we went around, you know, this is after the flood, what the fence looked like in spots. That's what they fixed it up. Got a new section there. Some of the sections washed out. The next one, you know, it's back up in place. I don't know what the next one was. Oh, we did get a ball wall to, or a ball wall because our portable one out there was getting pretty bad. And these guys were rather um, a lot cheaper than the other ones, so we had to clean the ball wall. And so we have a good ball wall out there now. It's safe. And the next one was the uh, container pass. All the containers floated down, hit the thing. That's what it looked like after the flood, where the containers were. And this is what it looks like now. We're going to try and secure them and um, anchor them to the ground so they don't float. That's what we're working on. And I think the last one was, oh, I just had some pictures. Uh, Bill mentioned the boring company. They came out with this rig to start with. And, uh, you know, they were trying, but they didn't get very far. I think they only got nine feet on that hole there. Then they brought this rig out, and they did get to their 50 feet and 20 feet on the poles and stuff. And so we got the boring of all done. As uh, Bill said, the uh, destructive structural testing is scheduled to start tomorrow morning. And um, we're working on the electrical engineering getting power to the temporary portables out there. We were originally talking about running power poles from the back all the way to the front, but we kind of showed them, and he's just, we're going to run off the 300 wing, so we don't have to run that power line all the way down. So it's been a busy month, but that's about all. Thank you. Our fourth, fourth through eighth grade kiddos, they did not have a playground for uh, eight months, and it was a big celebration for them to finally get the playground, and that is thank you to you. <laughs> 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 Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board members. My name is Sean Gadol. I'm the IT manager, and with me, I have Tammy Clark, our IT consultant. I'm happy to report to the board that we were able to successfully open up school with one-to-one -one, uh, Chromebooks for all of our students. Um, we were able to successfully, thank you to all the staff members, um, to hand out our Chromebooks, and everything's been going dandy since uh, we've gone back. Um, I would like to also add that I will have more to report the following uh, this coming month uh, in for the October board meeting. 
I am working on um, more um, cybersecurity initiatives. I would like to publicly thank um, the um, CISA, which is a federal government, and really, really appreciate the Biden administration's push to help local and rural um, agencies like ourselves who do not have the infrastructure to do these strong initiatives. So I would really like to thank that, the partnership with Cal OES, as well as the fusion centers uh, that are here local. Um, with that, I would like to yield to uh, Ms. Clark. And It's very short. Uh, good evening. There it is. If you could go to slide two, please, and zoom into the top section. So I'm going to be going over our FEMA and Cal OES um, projects. Go ahead up to the very top, please. Can you zoom in on that? Okay. Um, so we have those first three up there are our pending uh, initial uh, projects, and you can see that those are funded at about 75% from FEMA. Um, and the first one is just our equipment and uh, school grounds. The next one are three portables and its contents, and the last one is two temporary portables. So right now those are all pending initial project development. Um, so those will be coming up shortly as we get more information and more work going along. Um, all of these projects include hundreds of documentations, each that need to be submitted to the federal government for funding. Uh, our projects in progress, I'd just like to point out uh, the first one, our campus-wide debris removal. Um, this is pending some project uh, or some documentation this week, and then it should move into acceptance. Uh, the next one is our district offices and storage room and water pump. Currently, um, this is the this should be approved by next week. These funds should um, be moving into a process where they get released to us. Um, right now, it's being held up as they verify our insurance policy. Uh, the bottom one, that project there will be the very, very last project that ever gets submitted to FEMA. That is just our management costs. It's covered at 100%. So. All the work that uh, your staff at the school are doing, myself, Molly Barnes, Will Hoxie, um, those are ours. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these two projects that have been completed a total of about $108,000. We should be receiving payment for those soon. One of the things that happens when these projects get um, approved through FEMA is then they get routed to the state of California. The state of California has um, particular regulations and stipulations before they release those dollars to you. So they might have their own requirements if they get a flagged project. So right now, these two projects have been flagged for possible other um, uh, policies that we might have to adhere to. So uh, some fish and game, some animal, um, uh, um, some flooding, and some... Um, some pollution, so there's a whole bunch of things that we're waiting feedback on. It, it was really exciting to get these both of these projects funded, $108,000, and then all of a sudden the state of California sends this email saying, oh, wait, there, there might be more. So <laughs> um, uh, hopefully we will know more. Um, I did ping uh, our, our uh, county uh, today to find out where we stood on these. Um, because we should be able to get this process through pretty quickly and get the cash in hand. Um, the last thing I want to point out is we did have um, hopefully a meeting with the state and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they kind of came back. What we wanted to do, and at their behest, they had requested, let's meet with FEMA in Zone 7 and that's the PUC and talk about you know, where the historical uh, obligation or responsibilities lie. Are, is there more routes that we, or more avenues we should be taking for getting funding from other agencies? Is there other responsibility that shouldn't be falling to the district? And we kind of got three responses here from them, and we've stalled out on this. Um, the first one being that Zone 7 has submitted uh, 200 projects um, from the flooding that happened on New Year's. I went back through and watched pretty much every meeting Zone 7 has had for the past year, read all of their meeting minutes, saw all of their videos, I saw the Harlan speak, I saw um, Andrew speak at those meetings um, on behalf of the community, bringing up the same fact that 
Zone 7 covers the district and this area of Sunol. Constituents here pay a flood fee to Zone 7. And Zone 7 did not submit out of their 200 projects Sunol. And we want to know why. Um, and so Palo OES is basically saying we need to go through all of those projects and verify that Sunol is not on there. We already know we're not on there. I went and looked at the map that they approved. I looked at all the projects they approved on their meeting minutes. So this is a little bit of a runaround now from the state as well. Um, the next thing the state recommended was a, a rural development grant. And oddly enough, that position has not been backfilled. So there is no opportunity there for me to even contact somebody. Last but not least, um, Cal OES responded by saying when we were talking about mitigation efforts of putting up a type of retaining wall along the back line of the school property, as they said, we don't think the state or the federal government would fund such a project. And that was it. So this is kind of where this is stalled out at the moment. Um, we still would like to have this meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers. The reason why I pushed so hard on it is because we know in 2017, just upstream from us along Foothill, those homes lost quite a bit of, quite a bit of square footage of their backyards due to flooding of this creek. And I want to see the report that Army Corps of Engineers approved for that work because they are required by law to not do any work that would affect downstream. We are directly impacted downstream from whatever work that they did. We also know that um, SFPUC, who has partial ownership of this land through here, is spending millions of dollars just downstream from us over at the Water Temple, which is great and fabulous, but you just look across the street at the school who has suffered all of this damage, and you have to wonder why they're not taking responsibility over here as well. So I'm going to push a little bit harder. I know Molly has been, and, and Mr. Hoxie have been frustrated too, but um, we'll see, we'll see what, how much further we can get. I know that our, um, that our person over at FEMA that we've been working with, Linda, has also been doing some digging of some historical information to see where are these boundaries? Why is Zone 7 saying they don't cover this area? Does Zone 7 cover upstream, skip Sunol, and then cover downstream, and why? Right? So we really want to see some boundary maps and, and why that got decided the way it did. I just want to thank, thank you. County Clark. Um, FEMA, I, this is going to be a shock for you all or anybody that dealt with insurance. It's very frustrating. <laughs> it's very frustrating. And again, the flood happened on January 1st, and we are and we put through papers and papers and papers. Mr. Hoxie, the county, myself, Linda, our Cuba, and the bureaucracy is uh, interesting and very, very frustrating. We're on eight eight months, and we're now, and then like Cammy said, the, the funding flows, and it has to go through all these checkpoints, and then they ask for things that we gave them two months ago, and they say they don't have it, because it's a new checkpoint person, and then it goes to Cal OES, because then they're the ones that have to release the check, but they, they have their system. I think what was yeah. most most frustrating in this section down here with Cal OES and Army Corps of Engineers is both FEMA and Cal OES got on this virtual call with us about five or six people and said, you know, you, you need to have this meeting, you need to get all these parties involved, and then they stalled it. Yeah. So... Uh, it just seems like a lot of lip service, so we'll we'll see um, what where we go from we'll here. We'll still along, but big thank you, Cam. Thank you very much for bringing this up. Most people would give up if they had to deal with one government agency, <laughs> and yet you're dealing with many, and then compound that with an insurance company mixed with a government agency. It's, it's impossible. Well, so, reading meeting minutes for a year of Zone 7 oh. was whew, a lot. <laughs> no, no one wants that job, so thank you for taking that one. Um, item 7H, uh, it should have read board member reports. Sorry that wasn't clear, but sometimes there's things of SELPA board or CSBA or anything that needs to be reported out. Do any of the board members have anything they need to report out at all? I was just going to update on the um, AC. There's my letter. The ACOE board. Yes, they're yeah. going to have an updated. I sent it to you. Yes. It's on October 2nd, and they do a great job of inviting um, all the member districts to the county. 
to come together and disseminate information. And I'm hearing there's going to be a mariachi band at this one. So, so Linda signed up. Yes. <laughs> so I sit on this. I'm now the secretary in this group, and they're having um, assistance. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, it is on October 2nd, and they're, they're going to have also um, it's in the Castro Valley Performing Arts Center, which is supposed to be an amazing building. And um, they will also have shortly thereafter um, an award ceremony for, I guess, the teachers for the years from the different schools. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to for Okay. Uh, and uh, for mine, there was nothing from CELPA, and uh, the only project I was working on last time is I took direction from the board to speak with the attorney, and we developed a resolution for 9L that we'll talk about that. So that's for board member reports. We'll now go on to eight community comments, comments from the community. And just a reminder, the part that we read earlier, the limit is three minutes per person. Okay, thank you. The limit is three minutes per person with a total limit of 20 minutes. If there is disruption, you will be asked to leave. If there is disruption, we will respect the person who is at the podium who has three minutes, and we will pause their time, but the 20 minutes will continue. So please be respectful of everybody's time and let people speak. Uh, first, we have Rodney Zeiss. Thanks for doing the timing for us, Sean. First, I'm going to talk to all of you, and I'm going to start the first part one. Which I start with part one. And what I'm going to do is try to sell myself first. I'm going to tell you about me. And then I'm going to try to talk to you about the other side of my I have to get you trusted people. So this is about me. My name is Rodney Zeiss. My family's been here since 1931. I regularly attend the school board meetings here, so I'm actually going to keep it current what's going on. Um, I had a very nice compliment at the last school board meeting. Someone said, we don't know where you stand. <laughs> what happens to me is I'm all off part. You don't know which way I'm going to go because I try to look objectively. And come up with concluding what is best for a school or my opinion. That is my goal. And I was very complimented that I have it. On many heated discussions at the school board meetings, I've had the right, the left, and the middle thank me. We hugged, we shook hands, we had got pat in the backs. So that's what I'm just going to say. That's about me. What I'm trying to sell you. <coughs> is when you come up today, make sure that you sell yourself and the message you're trying to deliver. And that's done by being respectful and trying to find common ground. Do your research, do your homework. Make sure that what you have read and or heard is actually what happened. How many people here actually went over to the school website and looked at the video of the last two minutes on the main subject that we're talking about. How many people here? Raise your hands. Okay? Those are the people who actually did their research. Because I guarantee you, I saw the writings. And the writings and what I, I actually had, I was at the meeting. I read the readings, what was going coming out. I had to go back on the videotape and try to compare it. And in my opinion, it did not match up. And there's multiple. Now I can understand when someone writes a letter because I heard this and it creates emotion. And then you will continue and you may write a letter. But you should make sure, and you have time tonight, there is some time. You just go outside, flip on the school website, watch the last 10 minutes of the meeting versus just what you've been told or read. Think for yourself. I've repeated it here over and over. Think for yourself. Do not be manipulated. They said, I guarantee you there's people that I hear that have not looked at the video. 
And again, I had to go back, and I went three times back to com compare what I'm reading and what I saw. And I was at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just for clarification, um, next is uh, Midgey. Hopefully, that's all right. Just for clarification, uh, this is the board's meeting. You are addressing the board, not the public. So please go ahead and address the board. Thank you. Good evening, board. Good evening, Good evening everyone. So. I just, um, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a mom, and I'm also an educator here. I just wanted to, uh, would like to explain that, being a, uh, that a lot of people from other countries came to, United, to the United States because we believe we can be protected, the human, our human rights, our rights are being protected, regardless of what our race, our religion already come from. So why is it that? Because for me, uh, the American flag here is a symbol of inclusivity for everyone in the world, regardless their race, their belief, their lifestyle. So I would agree if we keep the American flag as our inclusivity flag, as at least in the last 200 years, it's been shown that if you see here in the Bay Area, you're very diverse. Inclusive, okay. So, <clears throat> just be very careful. Every we have we come from different groups, right? Just be very careful if we allocated only one group above everyone, and that is not called. It is not fair. I am an immigrant, right? So I know I come from other country. So, I'm a community here. I'm doing the community. So uh, yes, okay, thank you. This is open for any. Yeah, this is a community uh, yeah. comment. Oh, so, sorry, one moment. Sorry. So, just to clarify for everyone, this is community comments about anything. So, literally, the flag. literally anything. So, we're going to go ahead and let you Wait, continue to have your comments. Now for not yeah, that, this is supposed to be a it's this number is, eight. This is for community comments about any topic. So go, go ahead and get she didn't notify, right? She's talking about 9L, so I know. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about 9L. I'm just talking about me as an immigrant. And I see a lot of people here. We are very diverse. And I just beg everyone to unite, to love each other, to respect each other. And please do not say that I'm more important than you are. My group is more important than the other. I am uh, must be protected compared to others. So please, we are all here together. We are equal. The superintendent said, all men are created equal, right? Okay, so I just hope uh, people can understand based on history. The United States of America is also uh, listed in the great seal of the United States of America. It says, e pluribus unum, that's a Latin word. Meaning out of many is one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is C. I. Martin. You can keep the 20 minutes going. Oh. I'm here to make a statement to you. And to remind you that the election of 2022 did not give the board a mandate. The community is deeply divided about it. The tax of $22 million compounded, imposed on 300 households for a small school that serves 273 students, does not make sense to many voters. Almost 50% of them those people are hurting. Those still lucky to have been able to retain their homeowners insurance policies are now paying double and triple what they used to pay. For $50, we walk out of the grocery store with one small bag of groceries. It takes $70 to fill your gas tank. It's not that we don't care. It's the 30 years of tax obligation 
that nearly 50% of the voters are not happy with. This is not Ruby Hill or Castlewood Heights. This is Sonoma. People are hurting. It seems to me that when the idea was first brought up about a more balanced and inclusive oversight committee, the person doing that was personally attacked. The oversight committee should include six more positions filled by those who are not enthusiastic about a very large levy for 30 years imposed on 300 households for a small school. Then, when the rest of us became involved to support this suggestion, we were subjected to insults, ignoring, platitudes, and stalling. We continued to learn after the fact that this board was rushing ahead to make decisions, earmark, earmark funds, sign contracts, and move along as quickly as possible. Being informed afterwards is not openness and inclusion. People are hurting. One of my neighbors who signed the petition, and I gave a copy for each of you, not one of them challenged me or said, this is a bad idea. They said, where do I sign? If we are stuck with this debt, he said, Let's pay it off early and at least save some interest. If we can pay the levy in 20 years, we could save 10 years of interest. So let's get serious about fundraising. That means everybody, staff, students, parents, community. Let's get serious about fundraising. And let's ask our non-resident parents whose children attend St. Old Glen to make a voluntary a voluntary annual donation to pay off the debt early. After all, their children make up 80% of the Sonoma for our student Thank you, Ms. Martin. Robert Foster. What did he say? Robert Foster. The outside, maybe you ask? Oh, you're here? Right here? Sorry, I didn't see you. Okay. It's 20 minutes total for the time period. I, I think it's when they have to stop. I wrote 20 minutes. I moved to Sonoma in 1981. Never left. I have one son, Patrick, and his mother and I learned to love history. Eight care services, the education, K through eight. And I served as a board member for five years. Patrick loved his teachers, his classmates, and the other children around him, and these experiences are tradition this week. We are now a... <laughs> We're now experiencing... Um, the political of our school's board membership and the possibility, the possibility of some questionable changes. Specifically, one, uh, new censorship uh, rules requiring books already in the library to be removed, disregarding that professional Educators have already vetted all books and materials. People are talking about it. Two, adding the requirement for all teachers, which I was one at one time, upon sensing any student showing signs of gender confusion, to report this to their parents. It upsets me to have to deal with discussions about those things and uh, the emotional rancor of the companies that's there. Now, know this, and you know who you are, 
if you show any sign of seriously considering these changes, if you can expect a determined effort for rebuild. We do know about repo. It has occurred here, and we know how to do it. You are, um, you, um, um, need to know who we are as a people, the town, citizens of Sonoma. Next we have Neil Davis. Hi, I'm Neil Davies. I sat on this board 12 years. Uh, it's a long time. And in that period of time, I learned how to be a board member. You know, being a board member isn't easy, but it's also something that some people run and don't have a clue. You know, what the job is. These words, trustworthiness, responsibility, respect, those things are very important. And we're trying to teach our kids this. But we seem to have a problem there. So let me go back and, and make some, some statements, and maybe you will learn as you, as you request that you could. Last board meeting, um, AB 1314, Gender Identity Parental Notification was put on the agenda. Um, likewise, AB 1078 was put on the agenda. Instructional materials, removing instructional materials and curriculum, diversity. Those things were ultimately removed from the agenda, wisely so. But now we have another agenda item, which serves to separate us. And I see a pattern for me. You know, it, one of the things that I learned as a board member through attending CSBA and other institutions that provide background for board members was that student welfare should remain the primary goal of each board member. Personal agendas should stay outside the boardroom. Now, you can have any personal agenda you want. I don't care. What do you think? But once you are in here, governance is your job, not the management of the school. Governance which means you set policies that support the students. If you fail to support the students, and I mean all the students, you have betrayed the public trust. Woo! Woo! The betrayal of public trust is probably the worst thing you can do. The other item is that you're supposed to follow state law. If you do not follow state law, you betray the public trust. Thank you. I hope you can win. Okay. Next, we have Marge Corey. Margie Corey. Is Margie Corey here? She was here. Oh, there she is. Okay. Oh, my. I really enjoyed it. I could go 
So anyway, that's what all I have to say. And um, another thing is that I think as living in Seminole and living here for a long time, I find the divisiveness so destructive. And the divisiveness of a lot of it stems from the bond measure. And the bond measure was introduced to the Seminole community in a very short period of time. We had no recourse to actually do research on it, to find out what are some of the alternatives, options we have, so that it would not be a hindrance to the people that live in Sonol. And to many people that live in Sonol, they're in a limited income, and so some of them are retired, a lot of them have lived here for a long time, and so it is affects the community. Those of you who are out of the district, Probably that doesn't matter to you, but it does matter to the people that live in the community. So I would like to say that um, a lot of the device of myth came from this and the way it was introduced to the community. And I would say to Molly that she is partly responsible for it. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Laura Oka. I'm sorry if I'm reading that wrong. Laura Oka. Okay, so I basically wanted to talk about the pride flag. I want to assure people that objected to flying the pride flag. There is no agenda. Gay people don't have an agenda except to grow up. Get educated, make friends, get married, get a good job, maybe even start a family. This is an agenda that's much like the straight people's agenda. I'm betting. Trans <laughs> people too. The pride flag is not a special interest flag. Gay people are not a special interest group. They are marginalized. They've been discriminated against, beat up, bullied, and killed. If we were to tell blonde people to cover up and put it under hat, blonde people would protest, this is just the way I am. Gay people are just the way they are too. Sonoma has school kids in middle school. Some may come to realize they're different in a fundamental way from other students. It's hard to be different at that age. And it's difficult to realize you may be part of a group that's been ignored, dismissed, tormented, denied, shunned by horrified family members, beat up and killed and looked down upon by, by school board members who don't even want to acknowledge that you exist, let alone stand up for you. The pride flag simply sends a signal to those kids that are mentally <laughs> regarding the approval of Sonoma Glen Unified School District's 2022 22-23 unaudited actuals. Do you have anything else? Guy, all right. Did you know we signed up? Sorry, please don't interrupt. We're limited to 20 minutes. <laughs> 
Terry, did you have anything you wanted to uh, report on 9A? Yeah. Okay. Is there any board comments on this agenda item? Do you have any comments about this agenda item? No. Okay. This one? No, the clerk okay. is uh, pulling more, uh, is picking down on the other that side. Is, that's 9D, right? Um, yeah, I can give you a uh, nine A is email. To I can give that to you tomorrow morning. If that's okay, if you need to. Yeah, uh, they're kind of together. I can walk you over if you have a system. Okay. Of course, I'll hand it over to Mike. Actually, let's maybe not go out of order. Um, let's see. Report, discussion, hopefully, actual approval of the unaudited actual. So I make a motion that we uh, approve the unaudited actuals. Second. Okay, okay, and we'll go ahead and vote. Aye. Okay. And with that passes unanimously. 9B report discussion possible actions to approve the EPA spending determinations 2022 Uh Harris here. Do you have any questions? Do you want to explain anything about it? That's our annual report. The educational Protection Account Expenditure Summary. Yeah. Did you want to report on that? <laughs> Go for it. Okay. It's not. It's, it's an annual report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this is the um, Education Protection Account Expenditure Summary. Um, the economic. Protection account funds are a component of our LCFF funding, and at the end of each fiscal year, um, LEAs are required to give an account for how, how much money we received and how we spent that money. So for fiscal year 22-23, um, we received, so no blend, received $68,000. In addition, we had about an um, $88,000 um, carryover from the prior year. So in total, we had $156,062.56 to spend. And um, that money was um, specifically spent on teacher salaries and their associated benefits. And we're required to spend that on instruction. So it was all spent in the right buckets. Thank you. All right. so, you had a five-page presentation on the unaudited actuals, which is a different document. Was that all included when you gave this presentation? Yes, okay. that was just uh, more informational for the board. It just gave more. Um, this, this one looks a little better than the other one. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tara. So, I motion that we approve the EPA spending determinations 2223. We have a second. All right, and uh, all in favor, aye. I approve it. Okay, 9, 9 C, report discussion, possible action regarding the approval of resolution. 23-2024-03, sufficiency of instructional materials for the 23-24 school year. Did you have anything to report on that, Molly? It's from the public it's, hearing. We just had that public hearing. Oh, that was the same as the public hearing. Yeah. Now we approved that. Okay. Any questions from board members? Okay. I motion that we approve. All in favor, aye. Approved. Approved. Okay. Okay. 9D, report discussion, possible action to approve resolution 23-2404, adopting the GAN limits. Okay. I second the motion. Any all in favor? Aye. Okay. Yeah. 9E, report discussion, possible action to approve resolution 23-2024-05, designation of representative and alternate to the East Bay School Insurance Group uh, for the 2023-24 school year. Any discussion on that? Uh, there are areas. Whereas Sonoma Glen Unified School District is a member of the East Bay School Insurance Group, whereas East Bay Schools Insurance Group entitles each member district to have a representative 
attend all meetings of the board of directors, and whereas bylaws of the East Bay Insurance Group entitles each member of the district to appoint this representative, and whereas the bylaws of the East Bay Insurance Group entitle the authorities to designate alternate, now therefore be it resolved, that Bull Hoxie is hereby appointed as official representative, and Mullen Barnes is hereby designated as official alternate from the district to attend the East Bay School Insurance Group meetings, passed and adopted uh, 12th day of September if we pass it. A uh, motion that we approve. Two second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, next item is 9F, report, discussion, possible action to approve resolution 23-2024, approval of representative and alternate to the Alameda County Schools Insurance Group, ACSIG, for the 2023-2024 school year. Uh, this one is basically the same, it's up there. Uh, I'll just skip down to now, therefore, be it resolved that Molly Barnes is hereby appointed as official representative, and Mickey Whitfield is hereby designated official alternate from the district to attend the Alameda County School Insurance Group meetings. I motion to approve. Uh, we have a second. All in favor? Approve. Approve. Okay. Uh, 9G, report discussion, possible action to approve resolution 23-2024-07, designating October 23rd through October 27th, uh, 2023, as Red Ribbon Week, supporting drug-free awareness. Whereas the challenge has never been greater for California communities and schools to develop effective tobacco, alcohol, vaping, and drug abuse prevention education programs and activities in order to give our youth the chance to live drug-free lives and whereas it is imperative and comprehensive, unified and highly visible tobacco, alcohol, vaping, and drug abuse prevention education programs and activities in order to give our youth the chance to live drug-free lives. And whereas it is imperative and comprehensive, unified and highly visible tobacco, alcohol, vaping, and drug abuse prevention education programs and activities be initiated as quickly as possible in communities where they do not now exist and in communities where they do exist. It is imperative that these programs and activities be maintained <coughs> and strengthened and whereas Californians for Drug-Free Youth Incorporated coordinates the California Red Ribbon Celebration in cooperation with the National Family Partnership to offer our citizens the opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to the 2023 theme be kind to your mind. Whereas the Red Ribbon Celebration will be observed at Snow Glen School on October 23rd through 27th, and whereas parents, youth, government, business, law enforcement, schools, religious institutions, service organizations, social services, health services, media, and the general public will demonstrate their commitment to drug-free communities by wearing and displaying red <coughs> ribbons during the week-long celebration. And whereas the California State Board of Education encourages the <coughs> commitment of time and resources to ensure the success of the Red Ribbon <coughs> Celebration and year-round tobacco, alcohol, vaping, and drug abuse prevention education efforts. Now, therefore, be it hereby resolved that the Sonoma Glen Board of Education joins in proclaiming October 23rd through 27th, 2023, as Red Ribbon Week and encourages all citizens to participate in tobacco, alcohol, vaping, and drug abuse prevention education <laughs> programs and activities, making a visible statement and commitment to healthy, drug-free communities and schools. And be it further resolved that the governing board of the Snow Glen Unified School District authorizes the participation in this commemoration I motion that we approve this resolution. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Approved. Aye. Okay. I feel that one's very important. Thanks for uh, supporting that. Uh, and uh, if the deputies have still have a red ribbon program like they did when I was a kid, I would appreciate if they would uh, be invited to the school to help with that program. 9H, report, discussion, and possible action to approve Flint Builders contract for destructive testing 
for structural evaluation of the Simone Glen main building. <clears throat> I'm not going to read their whole contract. It's available for you to review if you want. Is there anything you wanted to say about that model? Just, um, they came highly recommended to us, and we had actually, um, Board President Jurgensen had a meeting with them, and I was really excited that they put in for this um, little bit of a smaller job, but it also gives us some experience in working with them a little bit more on specific projects that are site. They, they've already been on, on campus. They're already looking at um, building and doing some work, and so I, yeah, I'm thrilled to have, to have them as a partner. Yes, uh, it's it's unfortunate that we get to work with them, and we're considering uh, as we go out for contractors, they could be doing a lot more work here at the school. Yeah. Um, so far, they've been very helpful, and this is something that they're not really making money on, but they're doing that as a way to help us and to show us that they're doing what they do. So, a nice interview. Win-win. Yeah. Yes. Uh, any questions, any comments from the board? I've heard good things about them as I check them out. All right. Thank you. Uh, the, my motion will be approved. Second. All in favor? Approved. Approved. Aye. Uh, nine I report discussion possible action to approve the 2023-24 LCAP clarifying questions in Old Glen Unified School District. <clears throat> and more, did you want to present on this? Absolutely not. All right, so LCAP is my favorite subject, the local control accountability plan. Again, another government um, bureaucracy uh, document. And you just, in case you're feeling like this is deja vu, that's because this is deja vu. We had clarifying questions that we sent to you in, I believe, August. And unfortunately, the, there was another round of checks from the county office, and they sent it back to us. Most of them were actually very easy to, to <coughs> it was just um, budgetary mistakes, and we were able to update them. And then one of them had to do with that we anticipated our student, where our students were going to fall on their math scores and, and we wanted to, and then so they said why did you change it and we said because we wanted to capture that they actually did better and so that was that change and that was it it was pretty short yep that's it great any questions from board members okay i motion we approve all in favor nine j bond oversight committee Approval of opening up the committee for possibility of expanding membership to two more alternates. Molly, would you like to uh, explain what that is? Yes. So over the last uh, six months, seven months, we um, we have we had a process where people could apply to be on our oversight committee, and we went through a process of providing them to some recommendations through myself to the board. And we have no knowledge of how people vote when they, that is not a requirement and it is not something we ask them to disclose. And many of the people, um, Mr. Lauder's own father-in-law, I never even met him before, I don't know who he is, and he got on the, he got on the board. Um, but in any case, so we, we did a training, we had created these a big, a lots of um, documents for these folks. We had, um, they voted on, they created offices. Um, but the, in the subsequent board meetings, we had several <laughs> folks um, that were kind of not in favor of the bond, and they felt, I don't know how they would know how people voted on the bond, but they somehow feel that the, the bond oversight committee consisted of maybe more positive people than not positive people. And so they wanted, they, uh, they approached the board and asked if it would be okay, if we would consider opening it up once again for two more alternates. Right now, the recommendation had from the county, or excuse me, the, um, our bond legal folks, uh, was to have seven people. We have seven plus two alternates, um, but there's, it certainly doesn't preclude us having two more alternates. So what, um, in speaking with uh, President Jurgensen, what we were thinking about doing is going ahead and putting it back out, and or, or looking at the four people that already um, turned in. Well, I, when we were talking, the, the way we thought it would be most fair to try to help the people in the community that feel like it wasn't quite fair enough is we'll take whatever applications we had that were not allowed. We'll also open it up for about a two week period. It'll be posted on the website and anybody else can submit an application. It'll be reviewed by the superintendent, by the board, and we will make a selection of two more people. That's the proposal. If the board wants to do that, as 
at large members, not just alternates that sit on the sideline and wait for somebody to take the um, design. Yeah, the problem is we already have that process and we already have two alternates. So I well, think we can get things, uh, things in 72 hours before. I was handed all those applicants just moments before we had to come into the meeting and go to Conrad. So, I so that's a breaking so, so, of the brown. So what we're going to do is, is we have seven people on the oversight committee, which is by law, and there's certain qualifications for certain seats on there. Uh, we have two alternates, but what we talked about we're going to do is open it up for two more alternates. If they want so to be that, large people, and there's no rule that tells you you can't have more, and I listed yes. those school districts that have more. There are one that has 13, one that has 11. We so, but, that, have but this proposal, again, we don't... The, the board does not have to open this back up. The, 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 it is it is closed. We have met the requirements. I think this was an offer of saying, "Hey, we hear you, and we want to open it up again, Linda." So if we don't, we're not going to go back. voting. You so we're going to go forward per this item on the agenda and offer offer folks to be alternates if they want to. It's I'm, just like sitting on the bench. You're not playing the game. So I'm going to say I'm opposed to this because I think there hasn't been enough time to see how the, board, uh, the committee is operating. They're not meeting until November. We talked about this at prior board meetings where we determined that it made sense to wait and see how they operate. Anybody, as Ryan has said to everybody a million times already, they can attend. It's an open meeting. People can attend. They can see what happens. And then there will be a reassessment subsequently. So I feel that it's completely unnecessary to even do this. This is a waste of time. I just felt that you would show that you're hearing these people that are disenchanted how things are We 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 do we do uh, want to show to the community that we do hear the people that feel disenchanted or disenfranchised, the people that feel like the bond oversight committee maybe doesn't represent everyone. But uh, okay, all Marlene's recommendations, not one was to deliberate. The pro I want to clarify that. The process is, Linda, that the superintendent makes recommendations. We follow that rule. I made recommendations. I have no idea who half those people are. I didn't even know their names. I made recommendations. And the board, the list, excuse me, the board has the, the opportunity right to share their thoughts on that and then make a decision which you voted for. And so I voted against it. And so the, there that's the that is how that committee came to be. And as we've said over and over and over again, it's a public meeting. Anybody is more than welcome and happy to come and they are more than welcome to participate. Um, it doesn't preclude them from being there. And I, I know we talked about doing that too, waiting till after the first meeting and then saying like oh yeah maybe we should have more what i think this was trying to do was to, to say okay hey maybe we should i i, I spoke with president jurgensen and we were thinking you know what at this juncture maybe this would be a way to kind of reopen it up and and to try to find some middle ground to try to compromise yeah we don't it's very reasonable to, we, don't, we don't have to do anything no, I if, if the board wants to do it, we can. If we don't want to do it, we don't have to. We're going to try to come up with some middle ground. Uh, I, I will uh, maybe take a break here. We're going to have a, not a break for the meeting, but we're going to have uh, Mr. Chris Boberts come up. He wanted to comment on this. And while you're coming up, I just have a question. The, the card is not clear. Amber McKnight, I think it is. Sorry. Was that for this one? No, it's for the, it was for the uh, L. No. It was just, I had oh, to, I wrote sorry. the wrong one, so it's like a speed run of trying to write. No, no, no problem. No yeah. problem. Sorry. Just okay. clarification. No big deal. Sorry about that. I think I fell asleep and then went out of order. So <laughs> I could have done that. No, you're, we're on the right one. Uh, I'm Jay uh, so I wouldn't know you guys were all going to be here. I would have uh, dusted off my stand-up routine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Captive audience. Uh, my, my name is uh, Chris Boberts, and I am a parent of a small, uh, small guy and a small resident. I'm going to try to read this real fast because it, it might, I might not make it. But um, I am a board member of the bond, uh, a member of the bond oversight committee. However, I'm speaking in the personal capacity and not on behalf of the small Glen bond oversight committee. Over time, I've listened to requests to change the oversight committee by bylaws, add people to the committee, et cetera, et cetera. 
And it seems to me that there is still confusion regarding the duties of the Oversight Committee. So for your consideration, bylaws. Oversight Committee Bylaws 22, 2023 15C, Bylaw 31, Other Duties, Inform the Public. The committee, that the committee is an advisory committee and shall inform the public concerning the district's expenditure of bond proceeds. <coughs> Three, two, uh, review expenditures. Um, I had to cut out a bunch because we would have made it, but um, you'll get the gist. Uh, the committee is charged with a duty to review expenditure reports produced by the district to evaluate if a bond proceeds were expended only for the purposes set forth in the uh, J and B, no bond proceeds have been used for teacher or administrative salaries or other operating expenses. Three, three, uh, annual report at least one time annually commencing no later than the end of the fiscal year to this meeting and uh, to be posted on the district website. A statement indicating whether the district is in compliance with the requirement of Article 8A, Section 1B3 of the California Constitution. Uh, three, five, oversight of Measure J projects only. In recognition of the fact that the committee, uh, committee is charged with overseeing the expenditure of bond proceeds, the, the board has not charged the committee has not charged the committee with the responsibility for projects financed through the state of California, developer fees, certificates of participation, lease revenue bonds, the general fund, or the sale of surplus property, and without bond proceeds shall be outside the scope of oversight of the committee. The establishment of Again, not charged with the establishment of priorities or order of construction for bond projects, which shall be made by the board in its sole discretion. Not charged with the selection of architects, engineers, soil engineers, construction managers, project managers, uh, CEQA consultants, and such other professional services firms as are required to complete the project based on district. Uh, and not a lot of other stuff. Basically, all the responsibility and none of the power. So then, here we are with resolution to add two additional oversight or alternate over to oversight committee. Uh, simply, I see no value and a waste of resources. And I, I thank you for listening to me and wasting your time. Thank you. <laughs> so, any other comments about the panel? Board member? Okay, do we have any motions for the uh, Bond Oversight Committee approval of opening it for possibly expanding membership to two more alternates? Personally, I think it's a great middle ground. Um, we're trying to hear the community. We're trying to hear all sides. So I make a motion that we open it up for two weeks to receive applications to add two more members as alternates, the bond oversight committee will still function and proceed as it was with the same bylaws, but this is in a good faith effort to try to meet the community. I understand it's not what you are saying, it's not what you are saying. I feel like it's a middle ground option. Do we have a second? We do not. Okay, do we have any other motions? All right, so we'll move on to measure K. <clears throat> Staff recommendation, after the request for qualifications process, is to approve two firms for work on the Measure J bond program, Hamilton Aiken Architects and Adis Architects. Staff recommendation to include board approval for the superintendent to seek proposal for services on the highest priority project. The first priority is installation of the permanent portables at the rear of the campus. Um, I'm, I'm open to it. Uh, I think the two would be fine. Any comments on that from either board member? I I understand. I, I don't share those concerns. Any other comments? So my view is that we should come with what's recommended by professionals who have reviewed it and determined that these are the appropriate parties to go. So I, as a little bit of background, uh, Ms. Barnes, Ms. Barnes and uh, Mr. Savage here set it up, uh, and Mr. Hoxie, we spent time, several different days, uh, maybe 45 minutes or so with each firm, 
four different firms after looking at the six and narrowing it to four, interviewing them. Uh, it was a great process, it was very professional, and I'm grateful that you helped us find six really good firms, you helped us narrow it to four really awesome firms, and now I think those last two are great. I think the third one I also really like, probably equally. It's hard to choose between great firms. So I'm, I'm fine with, uh, and, and I'm happy to spend the time to, to do that. I, I spend a lot of time, not in these meetings, doing a lot of research and time on this. So I, I'm happy with it. I make a motion that we uh, approve those two. You second it? Okay. Any, uh, sorry, we'll go ahead and go for a vote. All in favor? Approved. Aye. Okay. Roll call. That was all aye. Yep. <laughs> all in favor. Uh, measure 9L, report discussion, possible action to approve resolution 23-2024-08 in the matter of the display of district flags and daily performance of patriotic exercises. We do have some community comments. Um, before we get into those community comments, I just wanted to give a little background on this. I'm sure many of you have already read the content of the resolution. Um, this resolution came up uh, when a, a couple of community members approached the board and the superintendent requesting uh, various different flags be flown at the school. Um, the attorney was uh, involved in some of those conversations. The uh, superintendent Barnes at the time said she did not want to make the decision of which flags to be flown and uh, suggested that that's a decision for the board to take up. So uh, we asked the individual to withdraw that request from the board and from the school and to bring it to the school board meeting. That was last week, last uh, month's meeting. Uh, that was brought up. It was something that was on a future agenda item. There was no possibility of action to be taken on it. And then the decision uh, by the board was to go seek legal counsel and to draft a resolution. Uh, I took the directive to legal counsel and I said, to me, it sounds like we need to come up with a resolution or two resolutions or have some options. His counsel to me was to have just one resolution um, and to not have multiple different resolutions to consider. Um, and we uh, developed a resolution uh, that is here before you. Um, I would like to say just a couple of things. I hear all of the comments from the community I read all of the emails that were sent to me. Um, before you make judgments about this resolution, please recognize uh, that you have heard from uh, some people in the community who were not involved with this. You've heard from possibly other board members who were not involved with this and misunderstand me. And I have been misrepresented and the resolution I feel has been misrepresented. Um, I believe you all have great hearts and want to protect kids. I, I applaud that, that is great. Uh, I also want to protect kids and we're gonna discuss that. To the teachers, I apologize. I am not trying to be disrespectful by keeping things in order. We're trying to have an orderly meeting. You are valued. You are uh, possibly misinformed about this resolution. Our, 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 our attorney has, has given counsel to the district, to not just me, to say, please uh, understand that this resolution limits uh, the district display of flags to the United States flag and the California flag, and it by in no means restricts the free speech of teachers. It does not restrict the free speech of students. It is only restricting the speech of the district itself. So the, uh, the resolution is fairly simple. It doesn't talk about every possible permutation of if a group comes 
and is uh, having a 4-H meeting and putting up a 4-H flag because that is not the district speech. That is not the district putting up uh, some sort of uh, flag or display. <clears throat> Uh, I sent out this letter, maybe some of you read it already. On Saturday late, uh, I wrote a letter in response to things that were going to the community. Uh, I did this after having spent a day of caring for my kids uh, and in sports with them alongside my wife. My kids are my top priority on Saturday. I am one of the three trustees of the board. My comments don't represent the whole board unless I'm directed to do so. They represent my views. I believe everyone needs to be treated fairly and equally. Schools need to be a place of inclusion where all schools are safe. Uh, all students are safe, sorry. My concern is that when a school starts endorsing any particular view that can be divisive. When the school starts endorsing any single particular view, it can be divisive. Then the school is then failing in its mission. I agree with many of the views espoused in our community. I think equality and equity and fair, kind treatment of everyone is of utmost importance. That's what we are striving for in this school. While certain issues may not appear divisive to some, there are many deeply held views on various sides of a given issue. I have been in a position to hear from many, many differing and conflicting viewpoints about this topic. Whether individual personal views align with those or others or not, the school should be inclusive of all. Individual views are irrelevant when considering inclusion of all. I prefer to seek more for what unites us as a school and community, a state and country, rather than to seek for what fractionates or divides. We are one nation, indivisible, the United States of America. As Trustee Romo previously said, board members shall hold, uh, from our bylaws, the education of students above any partisan principle, group interest, or personal interest. I agree with this wholeheartedly, and will hold to these values in the discharge of my duties to the school and community. There are many different views. Think of your own views. There are people who have strongly held their views in another direction. The school community should allow everyone's point of views to be welcome, and the district should not be seen as endorsing one view over another. The district should not be seen as endorsing one view over another. It is my understanding that we have a resolution to be considered on the agenda for limiting flags displayed by the district to only the flag of the United States of America and California. Those two flags are commonly held and legally designated. The proposed resolution seeks to endorse only those symbols and flags that are recognized under law as symbols of our state and country and exclude those that are not designated nor recognized as such. While I have been a board member, I have been aware of multiple requests made by various people in the community requesting different types of flags to be displayed. That has put the superintendent in a position of deciding which flags should be displayed or not. I understand that legal action against the school has been discussed. My understanding was that the superintendent maybe didn't ask the board, but said this is a decision for the board of the district uh, for the board to make regarding the policy on the district regarding flags. In light of this direction and request, I volunteered as board president to seek legal counsel from the district's legal counsel attorney according to our bylaws about drafting a possible resolution for a future meeting today. After much research and discussion with the attorney for the district, it is my understanding that we have before us the most inclusive policy possible. Although you may not agree with it, it prevents any potential or actual discriminatory behavior, conduct, or symbols by choosing one organization's flag over another that is by definition discriminatory. By not allowing others, that is discriminatory. Treating everyone the same and only displaying flags required under law is treating everyone the same, equitably, and legally. Further, it is my understanding that the display of the flag at the school has nothing to do with the rights of children and teachers to share their opinions and their free speech. This resolution seeks to ensure preservation of free speech 
and equity by treating everyone the same. My understanding is that this position and the proposed resolution treats everyone the same without discrimination and is the safest, that's my words, uh, in discussion with the legal, it was least exposure, least liability, uh, safest legal course of action for the Snow Glen School District. We are trying to do what is best for our school and for the children. Any legal action... Your attorney is shaking their head. Any... <laughs> please don't <laughs> Any legal action from any group would take funding away from the children and our school. Molly, I, I did not intend to be uh, disrespectful when I was keeping order with the, program, uh, the agenda. Sure. Um, your graphic that you showed with people on boxes, um, I would say there are people that need a little extra help. I agree with that. There are people in the community that feel like they're not being heard also, and they voiced that at the last meeting. Who are we to choose, or who are you to choose, to deem ourselves or yourself to be judged over how many boxes people get and who gets boxes? So, that is a little bit of history. That is a little... I would like to answer that, I am the superintendent. I'm responsible for the instruction of this of this entire campus. Right. That means the social, emotional, physical, yep. and, and educational well-being of the children. That's That's why. Yeah. So, so in this case, in this case, the, the resolution we have before us um, is for Sonoma Glen Unified School District. It's a government entity passing a resolution to limit flying and hanging flags other than the U.S. and California flags. This resolution only limits the Sonoma Glen Unified School District in doing so. In addition, um, others in the school uh, cannot put things up that may be seen as representing the district or the district speech, but free speech is not limited. Personal free speech, classrooms, that is not, not limited by this. This has nothing to do with religion. It is not discriminatory as it is a content neutral restriction that prohibits all flags. Uh, we have community comments. So we'll go ahead and go to right, the before I, I think we have to have a discussion before we go to community comments. This is a discussion that we're about the point of which we as the board can discuss this. Yeah, we can do the community comments and then have our discussion. No, I would like to actually discuss this first. Uh, no, there's no requirement. Uh, if there isn't, but as the chair, I'm going to do community uh, comments. And then, I'm just going to do I'm, I'm going along with our protocol when we hear the comments and then we'll discuss. So the, the teachers, is is there one teacher that would like to read the letter or all of you? Okay. by the superintendent or designee in his or her reasonable direction. 
precise language is critical for the intentions behind this message. Our message to our families is all are welcome, and we are proud to stand by this message for all of our students here at Sonoma Glen. Showing kindness is of utmost importance to us, and that means welcoming all students coming from diverse backgrounds, being inclusive to all, and making sure that all of our students are respected and feel safe. Banning sends the opposite message. We would never want our LGBTQ students, their families, or any other group for that matter, to feel like they're not wanted, supported, or safe at our school. In addition, we have many welcoming flags at our school of all kinds. Some given to us are made thank you by our students. Some representing other cultures and countries from around the world. Some from our youth clubs, go 4 h representing the sense of community. If this resolution is passed as it is currently written, we have much to lose. Another concern is that we feel that the board is not accurately representing the goals and ideals of Sonoma Glen School's historical inclusiveness of all students and families, as well as the current majority of the teaching staff. In addition, as stated on the school website, our second core value states, decisions will be made that demonstrate inclusiveness, modeling professional integrity through processes that are respectful, transparent, and proactively engaging to parents, students, and staff. Furthermore, the current proposed resolution is sadly creating division and strife in our small community. This is taking our focus and energy away from much more pressing issues and work that needs to be done in education and on our campus itself. Woo! They are. We want what is best for all of our students, and we know you do as well. Please do consider removing or modifying item number 9L. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you. Two items that you were going to let them go under my superintendent's report. So you said that they can go. That's what you said. They can go. You said both of us could go. Both. I didn't know there were two groups. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's a different union. That's AFT versus CSEA. Okay. So you can have that one, and then after this, for clarification, we will then move on to other community comment parts. All right. Thank you. We're writing to you as a CSEA Chapter 862 with the deepest concern in regards to item 9L on Tuesday's board agenda. We would like to see it removed or modified in a way that gives the superintendent or their designee reasonable discretion. We believe this is better aligned with our school's culture and best practice for long-term financial health at the school. Our message to income families is all are welcome. This initiative flies in the face of that message to be inclusive for all. You can claim this is about other flags, but everyone knows this is squarely focused on a pride flag flying for a handful of school days in June. Showing kindness is of utmost importance to us, and that means welcoming all students and making sure all of our students are respected and feel safe. We have LGBTQ plus parents at Sonoma Glen. We're already aware of some of them, as well as some allies' families who are considering pulling their children out of the school. We're aware of a potential sick out, which would also create significant funding challenges. And home values, according to a study by Realtor.com, are 49% higher than the median inside the top rated school districts. What happens to the small real estate market if we don't have a school district? You are creating a potential economic crisis. At every board meeting, Superintendent Barnes relays our student enrollment. We have an ideal operating capacity, which is around 290 students. It took a major hit during COVID, and we've been holding at about 273. Remember, Every student lost is lost revenue, which can translate into a loss of programs and potentially a loss in teachers and staff. Our fiscal health is your responsibility. You will lose students next year if we start delving into social politics that exclude a number of students and their families. We cannot afford this manufactured crisis. Growing low on enrollment, this will obviously would never survive with residents and middle school students alone. Thank you.
First, I must address the public comments made by Trustee Ted Romo in his open letters. Ted listened to the public comments during his capacity as a board member in session, and Ted misrepresented what members of the community conveyed at that meeting. Ted disparaged and spoke mixed truths about those citizens who spoke up. Reasons for eliminating added flags and symbols were given, but Ted decided to throw the reasoning given away, saying basically that the reasons given were lies. Later, Ted made unforgivable and slanderous comments about his fellow board member. He should be suspended for the outrageous comments he made against the board. <laughs> Ted called everyone who spoke up and the board member a bigot, which is a lie. Let's say that again. Ted called everybody a bigot, which is a lie, Ted. Um, you're intolerant and divisive. And you've mistreated some of the people that you represent. Um, I, I never heard you make meaningful suggestions about educational improvements. I tried to talk to you about tutoring and homework programs many times I was willing to get involved. And you never would respond to me. It seemed like you're more interested in making a gesture or a symbol than actually trying to help people. And when I see someone alone, I practice this and I always have and I feel they aren't being included, I bring them over and I include them. This is real inclusion. It takes real effort. It isn't just a symbol. It's true compassion. Molly made a great point. It's what you actually do to include people. Inflammatory and false accusations, such as those made, have no place in our community, and any member of any board or committee, no matter which board or committee, that are making these types of incendiary and intimidating remarks about fellow citizens should step down from his or her post immediately. If a non-public flag or symbol is raised, it could seem to separate a certain group. It can sometimes make people feel bad or humiliated, as if they aren't as good. Maybe they feel excluded or separate. Maybe they feel they don't matter as much, that they're not equal, that they're different. If you're truly worried that some students feel alienated, bring that together through art or sports or other activities, volunteer. And if you see a warning sign, talk to the parent or try harder to include the student in activities. Do something to really help. Don't just try to appear as if you're helping. The, the important point is that no one should discriminate. And there is no evidence that anyone in our community has discriminated against anyone. It's a made up false pre premise. And some people are using symbols to send a message, you're bigots. We're all paying for the school. We all care about the school. We care about Sonola. And every citizen deserves respect. Every citizen deserves respect. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Next is Crystal Diamond. Crystal Diamond. Hello, my name is Crystal Diamond. I'm a mother of both a teacher and a kindergarten student. This is my this is my second time around here. And I I was you know, so shocked to find out what was happening. So I don't know anybody on the board personally. But I can, oh, you can go here. I got three minutes away. Um, but I know facts. I can read what the resolution says. And I know whatever we want to paint it or say it is, it really is what it is. Because given the fact that somebody else on the board wrote something that had speech within it, text within it, that gave the power to the superintendent who we have as our leader to pick and help and choose and guide this school to where it needs to be, to where it's going. And I came on board when she very first got here. And to see go to this every morning, loving the students up, teaching the students, and having guided a lot of teachers who are new into where they are and to be coming and to see that stripped away from her. So let's just whatever the flags you might want to wave or whatever, let's see how it's ready to govern and run her school. Now, if, if it's about 
wanting to stay legal or, 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 or any of that, then we would have went with what the lawyer said. Now, if the lawyer was nodding his and shaking his head while someone was talking, I think that speaks volumes. Woo! Order. You can move me outside. Um, but with ending my minutes, because we don't want to keep going on, because we all have some place to be, I hope, I hope, I hope when it comes to voting next time around, Sonolians make a better choice. We have not been married for 20 years, so influence each other's uh, decisions uh, very much anymore. Uh, I uh, first moved to Sonoma 40 years ago. I spent the vast majority of that time as a Sonolian as I am now. I have often thought that this school district and all the school districts ought to be a lot more concerned in elementary school with basic reading and writing and arithmetic. I thought that, that that is a basic thing that we could do a lot better. Even as we're told, we're better than lots of other districts in California. California's not doing a very good job. There's the expert teachers that was closed an extra year. Um, all of these problems, we could do a lot better if we didn't focus on other things. My first reaction was, Putting up the basic flags on a flagpole was a small step in that direction. I have since read all of this and heard how destructive it's supposed to be, but it still is a small step in that direction. I think it's already been said really well that if you want inclusivity, that's what the American flag has always represented. And if you don't believe that, you have the problem. And that should get reinforced. I uh, was astonished. If I came and said this, I apparently would be biased and called a bigot. Uh, that was really offensive. Oh, um, I thought there'd be more names. And then I was really surprised that we had a superintendent who wanted to tell us about respectfulness, which was wonderful, just like the board president sounded. But then wanted to tell us about equality and equity. Equity is a legal principle. It means fairness. And then we had a process where she didn't want us to fair at all. She wanted to take over, have teachers come, spend more time talking than 20 minutes a lot. That, that, that needs reevaluation on her part. She has to see that. And the people who think this isn't a political, partisan <coughs> issue have to take the blinders off. Of course it is. My gosh, even the American flag now is, is that way. We are better off. Having districts step away doesn't change anything else, and that's what the thing says. No matter what you think you have to legal experts, that's all the relevant resolution does. And I know I have experience at least as much as any other legal expert. That's what it'll do, and I think that's still a wise thing to do. And if that's divisive and you want to threaten people, well, you've already done a pretty good job of it. You call them all a bigot, and you don't even know. I would hope they will go ahead
that a display flag may not be what you believe in, stand for, or even support, it may make you uncomfortable. Though, as a parent, we have a unique opportunity in that we are solely responsible for providing that, for providing that parental lens that no one else can. We have the responsibility and the opportunity to talk to our kids using our parental fil uh, filter and, and to teach them and guide them. We can dance around the fact that this is that this isn't about the pride flag if you like, but regardless of the flag that is that is displayed or where it is displayed, it opens the door. It's an invitation for me to talk and teach them. Teach my children through my viewpoint experiences and our family values. If we really think it's needed, bring another resolution with more clear expectations. But for the sake of our kids, I do not pass this resolution. Um, and for note, if I was on the board, I would vote for this. <laughs> No residents, I'll keep this short. My name is Anthony Rubio. I'm a California licensed attorney. I've been a resident of Sonoma for 20 years. I have a younger brother that's a first grade here at Sonoma Gwen. I support this resolution to limit the flags flying, and I believe that my interest in passing this is not only rooted in my desire to maintain the integrity of the Sonoma Gwen's learning environment for my six year old brother, but also for my children that will one day go to Sonoma Gwen. I believe this resolution is beneficial to the students of the school because it limits distractions and exposure to special interests that are not related to the school curriculum. Allowing other flags to open, to fly free, opens the door for numerous special interests and groups to demand their flags to be hung and will result in school educators spending their time on these matters rather than the learning of our students. It would also result in in our children being exposed to special interests, some of which relate to topics that my family and other families in this community would rather be introduced at home and at an age that our specific family feels is appropriate. To that end, I think it's important to note that the Supreme Court has held that in <coughs> schools that is between K and eight, which is younger students, we have a better, we have a duty to provide that safe and speech for those two people. So to conclude, I just want to say that I want to remind everybody why we're here, and that's to talk about the education for students between five years of age to 12 years of age. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the order was put in. Go, go ahead. Good evening. Sorry, can you pause the time? Just for clarification, our bylaws say if it's a controversial topic, we try to get views from all sides. <laughs> Thank you. You are so to you. You are so to you. You are so Part, everyone in the room has the has the good heart for the children 
and I wish that we could unite around around that. Um, it's disappointing to me as a, a parent and resident of Sonol to, to see some of the actions um, on both sides of this issue. I, I didn't appreciate being called a, a bigot by somebody who doesn't even know me. I've given a tremendous amount uh, to this school, both with my time and financially. Um, and while the, the, the teachers and even um, the person sitting here badgered me as I, as I came up, I find it extremely unprofessional because she doesn't even know me. No, but, 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 but that doesn't give her that doesn't give her a right to badger me. And it's running. It's just really disappointing to me to see the, again the school administration arguing with the board. You are out of order, sir. You are out. Right? You're not out of order. How dare you do this to us? You are out of order. You are out of order. on this topic. Thank you everybody for sharing your comments. We will now have discussion of the board on this item. Sorry? You might want to wait for the share. Do you think he's injecting someone and causing a commotion? Order! 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 If we need to hit the gavel one more time because people are talking, everyone will be out of the room. Everyone. And the board will go on. That is what our bylaws state. As the chair, I am trying to keep an organized meeting. This is about civility and discourse. Please, keep it under control. I know people are emotional. A lot of us are, and a lot of us are keeping it in control. Please. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm gonna have to ask everybody to leave. The board's gonna continue without anyone in here. Please, everyone go ahead and leave. I just got done talking. I spoke very clearly. Everyone please leave. We will wait until everyone leaves. We are going to wait till everyone leaves. I am the chair of this meeting. I am trying to conduct it civilly. No, I'm good. You can continue to watch it on YouTube. It will be recorded. Yes. Okay. Okay, everybody, please exit the room. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling your names and derogatory comments. I, I, I like when people show their comments. Thank you.
Everyone, please, please exit the room. We're going to take a short recess. Thank you. Everybody, including the media, you can watch on YouTube. Everybody's clearing out. Everyone, it's it's broadcast. You have access to it on broadcast. We aren't limiting your access. We are live streaming it. We, 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 we are broadcasting it. Okay. Uh, news and media, you can stay. If you're not news and media, please go ahead and exit. Everybody, please exit in an orderly fashion. Thank you, deputies, for being here to help us out. Appreciate it. Michaela <laughs> used to come to your house. Michaela is gay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, deputies. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's not going to be determined. It's my decision. Thank you. Please exit. We're not going to begin until everyone's out. I'm just going to give you this part of the talk session after I get my 
Is everybody else press? Can you let us know what group you're with? Hey, TV or Channel 2. Hey, anybody else? Uh, Sean, could you please close that door for me? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Ted has already made a few comments to the public. I have not given any indication of how I would vote or what I was thinking. I have read everything that's come across my email, let alone just Castro Valley has been over 48 um, emails. I have answered everyone up until about 12, 12.15 today. I have not been able to get back to the other people as yet. I have weighed all these things. I'm a teacher as well as a nurse. Um, I have very strong emotional feelings toward these people too. Um, I have good friends and family members who are members of the LGBTQ select group of people and I am very moved by some of the things that I've read today. I must, however, way in the balance here, the legal ramifications of doing, of not doing what we're, this resolution today. There is a Supreme Court decision that was made in October, in October 2021. It's Shirtleff versus the city of Boston. And I have done my best to get legal um, updates on that to find out if there's any case law that would affect how that would be received. It is still an active U, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision in which if you fly one special interest flag, you are required to fly any others that people want. And um, it, to not agree to this resolution, we put ourselves in a very precarious spot as a very small school district. 
in talking to one lawyer, I put out um, requests for two groups of lawyers, one being Pacific, I'm trying to remember the name of it, um, PJI. P -P -J -I. Um, I did not get much of a response from them, but I talked to another group of lawyers that represent schools, and I am being told by, by and another lawyer in addition to that that didn't fall into this category. I am being told that our little school, which is a one school school district, would be very vulnerable to any kind of legal action. It's, it's not as dangerous for a school district like San Ramon Valley School District that has 38 or so schools to fly a flag, but our little school could be vulnerable to lawsuits. One school, one lawsuit could take the school down. So based on my understanding of the law, that Supreme Court decision, and upon the vulnerability of our school, I am making the decision because I have been voted as a custodial person, a trustee of this board, to watch out for the children and the school, the welfare of the school. And I feel it incumbent upon me a fiduciary responsibility to watch out for the safety of the furtherance of this school. And because of that, I would be voting in favor of, of adopting this resolution, which does not exclude the, the welcoming and nurturing, hopefully, inclusive and acceptance of each of these students in our school district. Do not fly the flag and only fly the American flag is not saying I am against the LGBTQ people. Um, it, it, is, it, it is inclusive of all people and hopefully our kindness and our acceptance of one another continues and increases. Thank you. Okay, so we already know it's a bit complete. Let's first talk about <coughs> Shirtlift versus Boston, City of Boston. I'm going to read you the introduction by Justin Breyer, who wrote for the opinion of the court what the case is really about and why it's distinguishable from what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Quote When the government encourages diverse expression, say by creating a forum for debate, the First Amendment prevents it from discriminating against speakers based on their viewpoint. But when the government speaks for itself, the First Amendment does not demand airtime for all views. After all, the government must be able to promote a program or espouse a policy in order to function. The line between a form of private expression and the government's own speech is important, but not always clear. The case concern, this case concerns a flagpole <coughs> outside of Boston City Hall. For years, Boston has allowed private groups to request use of a flagpole to raise flags of their choosing. As part of this program, Boston approved hundreds of requests to raise dozens of different flags. The city did not deny a single request to raise a flag until, in 2017, Harold Shirtleff, the director of a group called Camp Constitution, asked to fly a Christian flag. Boston refused. At that time, Boston admits it had no written policy limiting the use of a flag for a base on a flag. The parties dispute whether, on these facts, Boston reserved the pole to fly flags that communicate governmental messages or instead open the flagpole for citizens to express their own views. If the former Boston is free to choose the flags it flies without the constraint of the First Amendment's free speech clause. And it goes on to say the first and basic question is whether the flag raising burden constitutes government speech. If so, Boston may refuse flags based on viewpoint. So, so long as the district chooses what flags to fly or not, that's government speech. That's not the speech. That you're talking about. Do you understand that? No, I don't. So, I don't see, I've talked to other attorneys. So, I'm an attorney, and I, I can know, tell you, government That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's true. But government speech is different from public speech, and public, private public speech. And this short lived case makes that distinction. We are talking about here how government speech is maintained. That's what Ryan's policy is. For the district, with respect to the district speech, it's not about whether an individual comes along and says, "Hey, I can raise a flag uh, on your property because you've allowed somebody else to do that. You've decided to do that. 
the White House, for example, you cannot go to the White House and say, you know what, you have a flagpole, and we know that you've chosen to raise other flags, so I can just walk in there and tell the White House to raise the flag that I want. You can't do that, because it's government speech. Depends on the factors. No, it's government speech. Okay, so that, that, no, let me finish. So, next thing I want to talk about here is what, and this is for the record, what we were advised by our counsel. It included that it's my legal opinion that flying the pride flag during the month of June does not create liability for the district to necessitate the passage of a resolution. Full stop. Okay? It also ends up saying all of this is defensible. You cannot say that we are absolutely okay and we are a small school district. There's nothing to prevent any individual from suing a school district. That's just a reality. You will have that regardless of whether you are perfect or not. That can happen. That's America. All right. Now, again, for the record, how did we get here? In 2021, the Snow Blend Board of Trustees adopted a number of resolutions supportive of the inclusion of historically marginalized groups, including persons of Asian ancestry who have been victims of hate violence, the LGBTQ community, and recognition of Pride Month, in commemoration of Juneteenth as a call to action against injustice of any kind. For the past several years, the pride flag has been hung during the month of June on the fence in front of the school without incident until this past June. At the June board meeting, it was noted that the pride flag was not hung on the fence and had, as had been done in past years, and it was requested by me, among others, as a trustee to hang the flag. The superintendent, Molly, given her authority to manage and operate the district, directed that the pride flag be hung on the fence. You all were there, you heard it. The day after the board's June 13th meeting, James Louder, a parent at the school and friend of yours, as I understand it, wrote a letter to the student stating, based upon the public comments at the school board meeting last night, I understand there is going, there is some community pressure to display the rainbow flag for Pride Month. If you're going to start hanging flags, I respectfully request that you hang the NRA flag, Christian flag, and Gadsden flag as a show of equality. Given the superintendent's authority to manage the government speech of the school, remember she runs the school, she gets to choose who goes and puts flag or what flag she put up or not. That's government speech because she's the district. The superintendent did not honor the request. As the Supreme Court stated in Shetland versus City of Boston, when the government speaks for itself, the First Amendment does not demand airtime for all views. So in this case, James Letter's request doesn't have to be followed. There's no obligation whatsoever for the school to follow. My understanding is that subsequently, when James and Ryan sought to confront the superintendent and pressure her not to fly the pride flag, she had the district leader council, Josh, here, explain to both you and James that the shirt, wait, that the shirt left case did not support the right of public of the public to demand snow women and particular flags. Is that accurate or not? That is that. Okay. Well, he, and you disagree then, and you both were there. The, the statement that I was there to pressure her, no, I was there as a witness. I was asked to be there. Were you there? You were there. I was there. Was it how to describe it or not? So, what I would say, Ryan, and you and I talked about this, is that what happened is that James wrote a, an email that said, Ryan and I would like to meet with you. That's, and so, that's what the email said, is it? Yeah. I'll check. And you can check. And so um, that made it seem like the two of you were coming in to share your opinion. No, that's not the intent at all. Okay. In any event, you, you emailed me later and said, Are you coming? I said, I can if you want me to. I'm, I mean, I, I wasn't emailing you about this. Yep. I mean, I put a question. Sure. Uh, I meant to say that uh, it was accurate that I excluded all people present at the city of Boston case. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's what I understood as well. And that was ignored, but that, that I think is uh, important that you did advise that at the time. But all I'm not ever party of any of this. I got never involved involved or included in any of this. So I have been having to scratch out because we can't talk. Mm -hmm. There's three of us. That's true. So we've got it'll become a, a crown act violation if I talk to any one of these people. That's so fine. I've been in the dark on everything except for that um, 
research that I do on my own and I've tried to reach out to different legal entities and I've only gotten a little bit of what I sought to get back and I've been trying to make a responsible and prudent decision here as a board member. That's fine. So while all of this was going on, following the hanging of the pride flag on the Snow Glen School fence, an individual during the middle of the night ripped the flag down and stole it. As a result of this theft of school property, which none of you objected to, I might add, the superintendent hung a new pride flag in support of Pride Month, but this time on the flagpole of the school instead of on the fence in order to make it more difficult to steal it again. Following the June board meetings, the next board meeting was August 1st. And as you know, at the August 1st board meeting, under the agenda item titled Future Agenda Items, for which there was no substantive materials or description provided, you, Ryan, stated that certain community members requested that an item be placed on the next board agenda to discuss which special interest flags can be displayed at the school. For four community members stating their disapproval of flying, quote, special interest flags, which one such community member, your friend James, in fact, indicated included the pride flag. No, so that was after you no, brought it up. I asked him. That's not it. So I couldn't say anything. So I it's not it. At August 1st, you were no, no, before that. You're making a so comment. August 1st, that's what we're talking about here. So at August 1st of board meeting, I asked James whether he, uh, what special interest flags he was aware of. He said the only one that he was aware of was the pride flag. So that's accurate. Okay, that's from August. Yeah, that's, that's right. You said that's, that. that's right. So, and, so I'm accurate in my statement here. So no. don't, yes, no, okay, let's, let me just read, no, let me read it again to you, just so you're clear. Here. James Leonard indicated that this included the pride flag. Did he not? And you asked him yes. Yes, that's right. So he did. He you said, asked him, does this include the pride flag? Yes, and he did. So that's my point. So I'm accurate. So that's accurate. Notwithstanding it was not supported by the opinion of the Supreme Court, <coughs> James and others asserted that the Shutliff case backed their action, which we've already distinguished is not the case. But you know, if you want to believe that, you can still believe that. As many of you know from my August 2nd open letter to Snow, I pointed out that California law provides that, quote, a school district shall not sponsor any activity that promotes discriminatory bias on the basis of race or ethnicity, gender, religion, disability, nationality, or sexual orientation, or because of the characters listed in section 2020, uh, 220, <coughs> education code section 220 created schools from promoting discriminatory bias on the basis of disability, gender, gender identity, gender expression, nationality, race, reference, religion, sexual orientation, or any other characters that is contained in the definition of hate crimes. Notwithstanding this, you push forward with the drafting of the resolution before us tonight. And as you know, when I submitted a competing reasonable resolution for inclusion with the board to in fact, various people in fact cited that as a, an alternative that might be acceptable. And that was submitted in accordance with the timing and content requirements for agenda items as set forth in bylaw 9322, you can look that up too. It was censored by you stating, quote, this competing resolution draft is not an approved resolution to be considered by the board. Query when we decided that, that's not clear. And as the agenda and items, and specifically this item, are under the direction and approval of the board president to develop, approve, and bring to the agenda and board meeting, I am going to permit only one resolution on the agenda to be considered. That's a direct quote from what you wrote. Where'd you get that quote? From me. From Molly. And it's entirely entirely legal to do that because yeah, she was asking it for the question. He forwarded my communication on to He asked me why he, the board president refused to. Uh, it wasn't my words, Brian. So I wanted to be accurate. Yep. I didn't I'm just concerned it. about you forwarding my communication. It's not hard. It's I public forward, record. No, I, didn't, I just forwarded you that, that phrase. So it was clear. It was information. Sorry, you weren't made aware of something that just made me aware. I wasn't aware of any of this. No, no. <laughs> she didn't need to. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. He asked but me why it you is a reasonable ability it. to ask the question. I see you ignoring Why something being, being um, blocked Sorry, and being put on the agenda? Yes, I think it is a reasonable question to ask. With that said, for the three members of the board, we do have to be here. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so what do we have with your resolution, Ryan? It provides, among other things, resolved that the governing board authorizes the superintendent or designates to display only the flag of the United States and the flag of the state of California at the Snow Plains School. If passed, this resolution, as written, would be limited to the uh, would not be limited to 
snow events schools flag pole, but would prohibit any flag other than the US flag in California Sur, anywhere on snow and property. So that flag right there would come down. Distinguished school. Yes, it is. That's a that's your opinion. No, that is that is a flag that is on snow gun property that was put up by the district. Okay. So that would be prohibited. That would have to come down. Another example, obviously, would be flags such as Red Ribbon Campaign Week flags. You just passed a resolution for Red Ribbon. Yes, there is a flag. You should be aware of these things. How about forage flags? Forage flags are put up by the school too, by the district. They're put up by the district. But that would be banned too under your resolution. No, no, we, we, the school does, the district does. But so, this is what you're doing. So I know you're smirking about this, but the reality yeah. is that, that the district is being curbed by this uh, widespread, broad brush resolution. In effect, the resolution broadly bans free speech at Snow Glen, including teachers and their ability to put a pride flag on their desk. There's nothing in the resolution. There's no express words in the resolution. Yes, it does. I'm a lawyer. I can tell you that it has to be clear. It's not clear. It, it doesn't restrict their free speech. It doesn't, it doesn't take away their rights. Well, let's go back and read. Well, let's just read the language again, just so we're clear here. Because you clearly, are, I would think of this from a lawyer's standpoint. It just says the governing board authorized the superintendent to display only the flag of the United States of America and the flag of the state of California at the Snow Glen School. Now, she is the superintendent. Any and all teachers and staff can be and are potentially designees. So, by definition, that means that she can make them designees and curb their ability to put up any flag she could. She could. That's right. That's what it says. Doesn't so, have to. So, she could also take it around and say that I'm not going to designate anyone and I'm going to allow every teacher to put up a flag anywhere they want, including the flagpole. That's not what I really want. Well, we can talk about that. It's what appears in the so that's every so employee that's employees are part of the district. They are the district does not have anybody but employees in it. So anything that a teacher does is by definition an action of the district. No, I'm not. No, I'm not done. So you're going to assert, among other things that we need this resolution in order to treat all groups of people equally. If we don't, this opens it up to liability lawsuits. That's what you wrote in your letter that you read earlier. Oh my, not word for it. Yes, it is. No, actually, I got it. You wrote, treat all groups and people equally. If we don't, this opens us up to liability lawsuits. That's a quote from your letter. But in fact, the opposite is the case. The fact, sheer breadth of the prohibition on speech by the proposed resolution makes it right for a lawsuit based on the grounds that it's an unconstitutional prohibition of free speech of students, teachers, and staff. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that First Amendment protections extend to teachers and students at public schools. Public schools may only prohibit private speech on public school campuses only insofar as such speech substantially interferes with or disrupts the educational environment or interferes with the rights of other students. And there has to be actual evidence of substantial disruption or a reasonable forecast of it, not just fear or apprehension. And that's what you have here. You are in the land of fear, not in the land of reality. So in effect, Ryan has put forward an unconstitutional resolution. The factual predicate for your flag resolution is premised on a disguised bias and failed bigotry. And the text of this, that's right, this one. And the text of his resolution would censor not only the district, Students, teachers, and staff. It should be voted down as a result. <laughs> You're not really a legal opinion on this. And as, You're right. I saw it, as I saw it, other people, I was told your school is vulnerable being a small one school school district. I think the term was you would be low picking, you know, what is that term? About? Low hanging fruit? Yes, yeah, low hanging fruit. Well, they would not go after the bigger school districts, but they would go after you. So and as such, I am concerned about the viability of our school being able to fight such a lawsuit. And that's why I tried the best I could to get some legal advice that would make it more clear how to place my vote. But the best I could do was what I got, and I made my decision that I'll try and protect the school but financially. In, but and to be clear, 
That's not the advice of the district council. Well, the district council is not the only person out there the, either. The, the district, district council, council said this form. is a council position. The resolution, the resolution, he, he did say that. Okay. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, Ms. Barnes, the email that James sent to you has said, are you available for me Friday? I've also asked President Jurgensen to attend our meeting as well. I've copied him here. You said, great, happy Father's Day. Yeah, these are the times at work. James says, great, I'll be there. Thank you for making time. Molly, Ryan, are you planning on attending this meeting? And I said, let me get to it. I cannot find my email. said, yes, maybe we should talk about this as future items. Like we did the other items that we were requested. So, just to clarify, he did ask you to be there. I was in yeah. attendance. Yeah. I was not there to try to pressure you. Right. And when you said that you did not think this was a decision, you wanted a superintendent to be policing and figuring out which flags can be flown by every group that's requesting it, that would detract from your limited time with all the hats you wear in the small district to be figuring out which flags to be on the poll. You said, this is probably something that should go before the board. James, will you please retract your request and take it to the board meeting? Is that about right? From the you, you, you told me about it his arm and said, you're going to have to bring this. I said, to the board yeah, you said that. And I said, no, can I, you bring it I to the not, board meeting? And I just want to clarify, because you and I had a conversation after that. And what I expressed to you is that it's the highly unlike unusualness of a community member coming and saying, I want to bring the board member to meet with you. Remember, we had that conversation after. It would be like a parent uh, that is, is not is kind of upset with the teacher. And, wants a super and, the, and, the, and the parent says, writes, the parent writes directly to the teacher says, I'm bringing Molly with me. Like Molly and I are, yeah. we're representing yeah. each other. Yeah, I and, I, and so what I, we had a conversation about yeah. is that it was really uncomfortable yeah. for you. You, you, know, you should, if what we talked about is what the normal protocol is for James to just say, I want to meet with Molly and Ryan. Yeah. And that's well, what, sure. so that was it. I said, you want me to be there? You said yes. And I said, okay. No, I just said, there. are you going to be there? Yeah. Because I was confused. Because yeah. yeah. I, so, I hadn't heard from you. Regardless, uh, this is the, well, the question was like how that made, how yes. was the feeling? I, I'm I'm sorry if I gave you a feeling I didn't we try to so I'm just, I was yeah. trying to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are not trying to take the ability to make decisions away from the superintendent. We're trying to make a policy decision about something for various different views in the community. We can see from the people over here that there are a lot of different views on this. And some of us may agree with one group, some of us may agree with a different group. We as elected officials try to represent the whole community. And we try to make the whole community feel welcome. So for that reason, I motion that we adopt the resolution before us here. Uh, 23-2408 in the matter of display of district flags, daily performance. Oh, and the daily performance picture audio exercises such as Pledge of Allegiance, I do Do I have a second? Okay. And all in favor, aye. Against. Okay. Nine L passes, you got that, Mickey? Uh, 10 consent items. We are gonna go ahead with all the consent items at the same time. Approval of minutes, August 1, 2023. Approval of warrants, dated 8-16-23. 825.23 and 95.23. Approval of personnel documents, September 2023. Approval of donations, uh, Mac Trucking donation. Thank you very much to Debbie Ferrari and Mac Trucking for donating thousands of dollars worth of work to remove the dirt. And thank you very much for the generous donation from Martin and Marietta. I'm going to read those two donation letters. Thank you to the press for being here. Thank you for being respectful. And patient. <laughs> Dear Ms. Ferrari, on behalf of Snow Glen School students, staff, and students, I would like to thank you for your generous donation of removing the residual dirt left behind from the New Year's Eve flood in Snow. Yeah!
The completely unexpected gift of generosity has made it possible for us to continue to replace, rebuild, and recapture the beauty and charming environment that Snow Glen offers to students, staff, and community. The flood was devastating. However, the outpouring of support from community members and companies like Mag Trucking has been heartwarming and also crucial to keep our precious school operating and even thriving amidst the effects of flood damage. Your efforts are appreciated by all of us at Snow Glen School. Your consideration towards Snow Glen is truly appreciated. For your records, your tax ID number is, and there it is. So, thank you, Mag Trucking and Betty Ferrar. Uh, in a letter, August 18, to Martin and Marietta Miller. Uh, is that correct? Martin and Marietta. Dear Ms. Mueller, on behalf of the Snow Glen School staff and students, I'd like to thank Martin and Marietta for providing a oh uh, for providing a yearly monetary contribution of five thousand dollars to Snow Glen School. Uh, Mark Marietta, that is the uh, four eight. Is that correct, Mark? Uh, five thousand dollars to the Snow Glen School. This generous contribution will help in providing critical funds for our little school. As technology and curriculum prices soar, these funds will help to ensure community. A continuity of learning for our students. Your consideration towards Smoke Land is truly appreciated. For your records, tax ID number. Thank you. Uh, Smoke Land uh, Unified Four Goals and Objectives. Thank you, Molly, for uh, creating those and presenting those at the previous meeting. And lastly, the approval of 2324 consolidate, Consolidated Application for Funding Categorical Aid Programs. I have a motion to approve all the consent items. All in favor, aye. Approved. 11 calendar, next meeting is October 10, 2023, and that's at 5.30, is that correct, Nikki? November, no meeting, December 12, 2023, and January 9, 2024. Closing comments. I just wanted to ask if I can have, by next meeting, a, a quote from either for how much more we are paying for this army because we took it out early. I asked that representative that was in our meeting back in April, and I have still not heard. It was February. I still have not heard how much more our citizens are contacted. Any contact with them? I did not. You can I asked the gal that was there that time. So do you have to write some location? Um, Contact information? Yes. I do. Molly, you have it also. Maybe your mom, can you give that to board member or trustee Herbert? Can you send me an email request again? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I understand that we're already using the bond money. Is that correct, Molly and Nikki? Yes. For some of the products? Okay. Yes. All right. Any closing comments, Ted? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, then I motion that we adjourn our meeting until the next meeting.